lágrima. Cecilia Binandapa, per the OSP document, has seven accounts, three and four respectively, with two separate banks. The Office of the Special Prosecutor is investigating her for corruption and corruption-related offenses following the revelation that she was keeping more than $1 million in her Abilenkwe home. This comes whilst the police and Attorney General are prosecuting persons accused of stealing the alleged monies from the minister's house. It emerged on Friday, July 21st, that two house helps of the minister were facing charges before an Accra circuit court for allegedly stealing an amount of $1 million, 300,000 euros, and millions of Ghana cities at the former minister's residence at Abelenkwe, Accra, in October 2022. The two 18-year-old patients Bukwe and 30-year-old Sarah Ajayi allegedly stole the monies and personal effects of the couple between the months of July and October 2022. Both have been charged with one count of conspiracy to commit a crime and five counts of stealing $1 million, 300,000 euros, and millions of Ghana cities. Cecilia Dapa subsequently resigned from her position after a public opera. She was arrested by the Office of the Special Prosecutor and was later granted bail. Subsequently, the Special Prosecutor announced that his office was investigating the controversial and much talked about issue. It recently froze the former minister's account of $5 million, 48 million Ghana cities, which was found in her Prudential Bank account. Also, it found 1 million cities in investments and 700,000 cities in cash in her Societe Generale account. Meanwhile, President Nana Adudankwe Kufuado has appointed the Minister of State at the Presidency and Member of Parliament for Tano North Constituency, Frida Akosua Ohinia Freo Prempe, to take over as Minister for Sanitation and Water Resources following Cecilia Benadapé's resignation from office. Taking note of the expiration of the one-week ultimatum given for the restoration of constitutional order in the Republic of Niger, decide as follows. A. Reiterates its strong condemnation of the attempted coup d'etat and the continued illegal detention of President Mohamed Bazoum, his family, and members of his government. B. Further condemns the, con the condition in which President Bazoum is being detained and hold the CNSP fully and solely responsible for the safety, security, and physical in integrity of President Bazoum, members of his family and government. C, uphold all measures and principles agreed upon by the extraordinary summit held on Niger on 30th July, 2023. Underscore the determination of the ECOWAS authority to keep all options on the table for the peaceful resolution of the crisis. Enforce all measures, in particular border closures and strict travel bans and assets freeze, on all persons or groups of individuals whose actions hinder all peaceful efforts aimed at ensuring the smooth and complete restoration of constitutional order. Warn member states who, by their action directly or indirectly, hinder the peaceful resolution of the crisis in Niger about the consequences for their action before the community. Call on the African Union to endorse all the decisions taken by the ECOWAS authority on the situation in Niger. Further call on all partner countries and institutions, including the United Nations, to support ECOWAS in its effort to ensure a quick restoration of constitutional order in conformity with its normative instruments. Direct the President of the Commission to monitor the implementation of the sanctions. Direct the Committee of the Chief of Defense Staff to activate the ECOWAS standby force with all its elements immediately. Order the deployment of the ECOWAS standby force to restore constitutional order in the Republic.
Onion traders at Ajayin Kotoko are unhappy with their inability to carry on with their daily business due to the unforeseen circumstances of the Niger coup. The insecurity of the borders has left many trucks stranded, leaving many traders in debt. The absence of their fellow traders is heavily felt as many have nothing else to sell, forcing them to increase prices as the demand is very high with a low supply of onions. Though a substitute has been given to import from Nigeria, the traders complain of its low quality and bad taste left with insufficient onion harvest from local farmers and called for the president's timely intervention. Ghanaian onion traders who have been stranded at the Beni border for an extended period have appealed to President Nanadu Dankwe Kufuado to intervene and secure the release of approximately 70 trucks carrying onions from Niger to Ghana via Beni. As a consequence of the border closure arising from the Niger coup, these trucks and their drivers have been immobilized at the border for several weeks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you are very much welcome to this second extraordinary summit on the social political situation in the Republic of Nigeria. Today, we gather with profound sense of urgency and firm determination, building upon the commitment made during our first extraordinary summit on the great political crisis befalling our sister nation. During that initial meeting, we voiced our solidarity with the people of Niger and their democratically elected president. His Excellency Mohamed Bazou by condemning the military takeover and the unjust detention of their democratically elected president and other officials. As you may recall, we call the juncture to rescind the decision of the of them toppling a democratically elected government. We proceeded to impose sanctions with the hope that this resolute measure will serve as a catalyst for the restoration of the constitutional order in Nigeria. Regrettably, the seven-day ultimatum we issued during the fourth summit has not yielded the desired outcome. We have also made diligent effort through the deployment of various ECOWAS mediation teams. I'm glad Abdul Salam Abubakar is here. His Eminence is here. Baban Kanogingib is here. To give you their report and their observation during the intervention. Today's summit provides a significant opportunity for meticulously reviewing and assessing the progress made since our last gathering. It is essential to evaluate the, the effectiveness of our interventions and identify any gaps or challenges that may have in that progress. Only through this comprehensive assessment can we collectively chart a new sustainable path towards lasting peace, stability, and prosperity in Niger.
taking note of the expiration of the one-week ultimatum given for the restoration of constitutional order in the Republic of Niger, decide as follows. A. Reiterates its strong condemnation of the attempted coup d'etat and the continued illegal detention of President Mohamed Bazoum, his family, and members of his government. B. Further condemns the, con the condition in which President Bazoum is being detained and hold the CNSP fully and solely responsible for the safety, security, and physical in integrity of President Bazoum members of his family and government. C. Uphold all measures and principles agreed upon by the extraordinary summit held on Niger on 30th July 2023. Underscore the determination of the ECOWAS authority to keep all options on the table for the peaceful resolution of the crisis. Enforce all measures, in particular border closures and strict travel bans and assets freeze, on all persons or groups of individuals whose actions hinder all peaceful efforts aimed at ensuring the smooth and complete restoration of constitutional order. Warn member states who, by their action directly or indirectly, hinder the peaceful resolution of the crisis in Niger about the consequences for their action before the community. Call on the African Union to endorse all the decisions taken by the ECOWAS authority on the situation in Niger. Further call on all partner countries and institutions, including the United Nations, to support ECOWAS in its effort to ensure a quick restoration of constitutional order in conformity with its normative instruments. Direct the President of the Commission to monitor the implementation of the sanctions. Direct the Committee of the Chief of Defense Staff to activate the ECWA standby force with all its elements immediately. Order the deployment of the ECWA standby force to restore constitutional order in the Republic Ghanian traders at Ajian Kotoko are unhappy with their inability to carry on with their daily business due to the unforeseen circumstances of the Niger coup. The insecurity of the borders has left many trucks stranded, leaving many traders in debt. The absence of their fellow traders is heavily felt as many have nothing else to sell, forcing them to increase prices as the demand is very high with a low supply of onions. Though a substitute has been given to import from Nigeria, the traders complain of its low quality and bad taste left with insufficient onion harvest from local farmers and called for the president's timely intervention. Ghanaian onion traders who have been stranded at the Benin border for an extended period have appealed to President Nanadu Dankwe Kufuadu to intervene and secure the release of approximately 70 trucks carrying onions from the jet to Ghana via Benin. As a consequence of the border closure arising from the Niger coup, these trucks and the drivers have been immobilized at the border for several weeks. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you are very much welcome to this second extraordinary summit on the social political situation in the Republic of Nigeria. Today, we gather with a profound sense of urgency and firm determination, building upon the commitment made during our first extraordinary summit on the great political crisis befalling our sister nation. During that initial meeting, we voiced our solidarity with the people of Niger and their democratically elected president. His Excellency, 
Mohamed Bazou by condemning the military takeover and the unjust detention of their democratically elected president and other officials. As you may recall, we call the juncture to rescind the decision of, the to of them toppling a democratically elected government. We proceeded to impose sanctions with the hope that this resolute measure will serve as a catalyst for the restoration of the constitutional order in Niger. Regrettably, the seven-day ultimatum we issued during the fourth summit has not yielded the desired outcome. We have also made diligent effort through the deployment of various ECOWAS mediation teams. I'm glad Abdul Salam Abubakar is here. His Eminence is here. Baban Kanogingibe is here. To give you their report and their observation during the intervention. So this summit provides a significant opportunity for meticulously reviewing and assessing the progress made since our last gathering. It is essential to evaluate the, the effectiveness of our interventions and identify any gaps or challenges that may have in that progress. Only through this comprehensive assessment can we collectively chart a new sustainable path towards lasting peace, stability, and prosperity in Niger. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people. Mother of all talk shows, Alaji and Alaji, this morning. It's a pleasure to be coming your way live from the studios of Pan African Television. And as usual, today we'll discuss the issues that need to be discussed on this platform. I am Sena Nombo. Like I said, we are live on Pan African Television. We are also live on the social media platform of Pan African Television. We are live on Facebook. You can find us on Pan African Television. Join the feed, and when you are there, use the comment section to share uh, a thought or two about the discussions we'll be having today. And then we are live on radio. 
on Radio Gold 90.5 FM. We are also live on several affiliate radio stations across the country. A big thank you to all our affiliates this morning. This morning we are discussing Niger again. Recall the last time we were here, the discussion was around the threats of military force being used against the junta that are taking over in Niger. Well, the one week deadline expired. ECOWAS held an extraordinary session. It was attended by eight, head, let's just assume heads of state or eight nations, because not all heads of states were there, including our own. President Nanado Dankwe Kufuado. Um, basically, they said they will continue to use diplomacy, uh, but all options are on the table. But speaking to the junta has become difficult because they keep rejecting any attempt to have a conversation with them from ECOWAS. We'll be discussing the latest development in that situation in Niger in our very first topic. Then we'll go back to the matter of the what started as a theft case involving a mate and a former mate and their accomplices. That's between Madame Cecilia Abunadapa and those people involved, the Republic versus four others. Uh, so we'll discuss the Cecilia Abunadapa theft saga and the latest development because the special prosecutor has moved to free some seven accounts that she holds at Prudential Bank and Societe General, and he wants a confirmation order. There are also ongoing disagreements between the police and then the Attorney General, specifically in one case involving uh, the matter of whether or not the money belongs to $800,000 that belong to Madame Cecilia Abunadapa. Very interesting discussions ongoing in there. But we'll speak to the latest development in that issue. Then we'll end at the Bank of Ghana. The Bank of Ghana, they close in its annual statement that what they have done is to write off some 48, over 48 billion cities that they lent to government. They said they are now a loss absorber. And the minority says, you look at your law carefully. You cannot do that without resorting to parliament. You cannot just sit in your office and be cancelling loans advanced. That is not allowed. You, are, you have acted in breach of your own law. But that's not the only issue that has been. There are several other issues that have been raised from that annual statement that has been filed at the Bank of Ghana. So we'll conclude on that note. Joining me this morning for this discussion is Kome uh, Kwesi Pratt Jr., who is General Secretary of the Socialist Movement of Ghana. Always wonderful to see him uh, on a Saturday morning, I always say. And then we're also joined by ranking member on the Defense and Interior Committee of Parliament. Honorable James Agaga, who has made the point consistently that without the approval of parliament, uh, President Ekufuado cannot move troops to join ECOWAS in any military intervention in Niger. He joins us this morning. We'll would also be joined by Mr. Philip Landon. Mr. Philip Landon is a, a fairly senior member of the New Patriotic Party. He also speaks for the party. He will join us to complete our panel of three this morning. We're supposed to have been joined by Jifa Tega, uh, but uh, unfortunately she's unable to join us because of some health issues. Speedy recovery to you, Jifa. Uh, so that's our panel for today to discuss the issue that we set out. Like I said, your comments are important to us. We'll be displaying um, a number on our screen. Please use that number and send us a text message or a WhatsApp message. It's not a calling. It's not for phonings. It's for text message or WhatsApp. So please do. Uh, join and be a part of it. Once again, thank you. And let's start from Niger. Like I said, I'll start from my right uh, with Honorable James Agaga on the issue in Niger and ECOWAS insistence that all options are on the table. Good morning to you. Good morning, Senator. Good morning to my senior comrade, Kukwesi Pratt, Julia. I'm told um, he celebrated his birthday a couple of days ago. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to um, be part and to honor him. I wish him a, 
and God's uh, continuous blessings and uh, guidance in all his endeavors. Good morning to your viewers. Yes, Senna. Niger is um, um, the situation is, I think, um, caught the attention of all of us. Now, we all know what happened in Niger. The military um, overthrew the um, democratically elected president, Bazoum, from office. And immediately that happened, ECOWAS convened the meeting of his authority of uh, heads of state and government and immediately threatened to use force on the Republic of Niger. Thereafter, the reaction from the junta itself and its um, allies, notably Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali, and some other countries outside the um, ECOWAS region, such as um, Algeria, all pledged support for the... Um, now, so many questions have arisen. One, was it proper for ECOWAS to have threatened to use force as its first option? Or it was better for ECOWAS to have pursued a diplomatic option to defuse the tension in that country? So now, I, 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 I am of the view that right from the outset, ECOWAS got it wrong when they threatened to use force at, at, as, as a first option. Now, when you do that, I want to ask, do we have any legal basis for ECOWAS to threaten to use force? The issue is very debatable. Because ECOWAS is a, a sub-regional body, which is entitled to adapt protocols, to regulate... I mean, it's um, affairs. I am aware there are some protocols in place which sort of uh, gives ECOWAS the power to resort to some collective security measures. When, for instance, there is a massive violation of the fundamental rights of citizens of ECOWAS, two, when the rule of law is sidestepped or breached in member states, and lastly, when governments are democratically elected governments are overthrown, ECOWAS has adopted protocols which allows it to apply force to remedy the situation. Now, there is the uh, UN Charter, which was adopted in 1945, which created the Security Council. And as you may be aware, under that charter, it is only the UN Security Council, which is clothed with the power to authorize the use of force. You know, so... The ECOWAS model, which allows a regional body to authorize the use of force, is actually one of its kind. Of all the regional organizations we have, it is only ECOWAS which has assumed those powers. One may argue that the assumption of such a mandate derogates from the UN Charter because the UN Charter expressly states that it is only the Security Council which is entitled to authorize the use of force. Now, why is it that the UN Security Council has not been convened to look into the happenings in Niger and to possibly authorize the use of force? Clearly, they, they, they we are moving into a multipolar world situation where you have the Russians who are permanent members of the Security Council and can veto resolutions that are proposed, and China, 
which has also become resurgent as a global power. All these countries have their views so far as the Niger crisis are concerned. And so if a resolution were to be introduced before the UN Security Council, I am sure that resolution would not see the day of light because China or Russia would most likely veto such a resolution to authorize the use of force in, um, in Niger. It is very fresh in my mind, uh, you know, when the Russians, for instance, express deep regret about their failure to act in the case of Libya because a resolution was introduced before the Security Council and under the guise of, say, going in, you know, to intervene on humanitarian grounds, there was no authorization for the ouster of the Gaddafi regime. Unfortunately, when the United States and its allies moved into uh, uh, Libya, the mandate changed. The Russians expressed deep regret. So if that is anything to go by, I, I have no doubt. And subsequently, when, uh, I mean, Syria came under attack, you saw the reaction of the Russians. So I, I, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that if a resolution were to be brought before the Security Council, the, the, that such a resolution would not see the day of light in, in, in respect of the unfolding situation in, 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 in um, Niger. Now, Senna, is that the reason why some Western interests, some West African leaders have sought to invoke the ECOWAS collective security mechanism to intervene in Niger, something they otherwise wouldn't have uh, gotten from the UN Security Council. They now want to come under the umbrella of ECOWAS and intervene in Niger. That is a fundamental question that, 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 that should engage our attention. But you see, the point is, ECOWAS itself has credibility issues. Because all along we have lived with this particular protocol since 1999. The protocol on, you know, its collective security mechanism has been with us since 1999. Now, how has it been applied? Have we witnessed massive human rights violations in member states or not? If you have been following the news, there is no question about the fact that there have been massive human rights violations in, I can say, the overwhelming uh, a, a majority of states that make up ECOWAS. And those violations should include, for instance, the repression of political rights, the right to freely, I mean, change governments through the ballot box if a government is non-performing. But what has been the reaction of ECOWAS? So when constitutions, national constitutions are manipulated to allow for presidents to contest elections beyond the term limit set in those constitutions, then you have a situation whereby the political rights of the citizens of the countries involved are violated with this attendant application of force to crash lawful demonstrations, what has been the response of ECOWAS? So, Sena, so if we take the example of Guinea, we saw how the constitution of that country under Alpha Conde was amended at the last moment to allow for Alpha Conde to run for a third term. What did Ekowa say? They were quiet. Now, in the aftermath of the amendment to the Guinean constitution to allow for Conde's uh, third term bid, you saw people pour out onto the streets to demonstrate in order to uphold their rights. They were attacked. People were were shot at. So many people, people died. 
right to life was violated. Did the Kowa send an intervention force? They did not. Something very similar happened in Côte d'Ivoire. And even in recent times, Senegal, I think Makisal came under immense pressure and had to chicken up because he, he was actually bent on running for a third term. You saw the demonstrations in that country. What was the reaction of ECOWAS? You see, a law or an international treaty loses legitimacy if it is selectively applied. And that is what ECOWAS is guilty of. You see, that is what ECOWAS is guilty. So it's, it's ECOWAS has become a club, sort of, of some dinosaurs, heads of state, who are bent on protecting themselves against the mass of the people, the rule. So they, they can choose to do anything and get away with it. Now, when all available options fail and the military decides to intervene, ECOWAS says they have a zero tolerance for coups. So at that point, they are quick to say, let's mobilize forces and move in and uh, 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 reinstate presidents who have been overthrown. So, Senator, that is the problem we are faced with. The selectivity with which ECOWAS wants to act. Or oh, ECOWAS has been acting over the period, does not give it legitimacy at all. And a typical example is Niger. In addition to that, let's talk about the terror threat. You see, Burkina Faso, I mean, has been fighting terrorism for a very long time, since 2015. They have been fighting terrorism. The terrorists have maimed people. They have seized territory. Commerce in Burkina Faso, I mean, has been brought to its knees. The country is literally struggling. They have been begging for support. What was the response of ECOWAS? But ECOWAS has protocols on counter-terrorism and they have focal persons, etc. What did we do in the collective to support such a country? Did ECOWAS offer them some little support? Just give them the weaponry, support them to fight. Did you see that happen? We abandoned Burkina Faso. Mali. So when the people are abandoned, they are asked to, you know, manage their own affairs. Even when they have signed on to ECOWAS protocols. What do you expect? So for instance, Burkina Faso, which borders, I mean, my region, a chunk of this territory, it's not under governmental control. So the territorial integrity of Burkina Faso has been breached. The Decoas deem it appropriate to send an intervention force to support the Burkina base to ward off the terror threat. Have they done that? Have they thought about it? But so if the Burkina base decide to take their destiny into their hands, Niger faces a similar threat, Mali, then you are quick to say, you will send, you would invoke your collective security mechanism to reinstate democratically elected governments. You know, in Burkina Faso, I'm not by any stretch of imagination endorsing coups. Far from that. But we must speak to the reality on the ground. So, a civilian elected uh, government was overthrown. A second, you know, coup happened in Burkina Faso because they are just struggling to find solutions to the terror threat. Niger is not any different. Mali. So clearly, ECOWAS is sending the, a, a certain message, which is very bad, that they are interested in protecting themselves, the leadership. It doesn't matter 
the violations the people suffer, the human rights violations, etc. That is not their problem. It's not their worry. So, Senna, as for me, this ECOWAS threat to use force does not enjoy support amongst the people at all. It doesn't. That explains why when Tinubu, who is now ECOWAS chairman, announced that ECOWAS would intervene militarily and, and gave the uh, Nigerian military janta an ultimatum, he subsequently went to the Nigerian Congress. And Congress said, no, you can't go to war. Use political means to resolve the crisis. So, in effect, the people of Nigeria have spoken out against any use of force in Niger by ECOWAS. Now, you are aware that Ghana plays a critical role. I'm sure President Akufado was the, is the immediate uh, past chairman of ECOWAS. And so, before ECOWAS took the decision to use force, he must have played a crucial role to go to war, to commit Ghanaian soldiers to a war in Niger. That is a very serious commitment to make. Now, I have stated that our government cannot commit our army to a battle, war, without seeking parliamentary approval. I insist that that is the position. It doesn't matter whether we have signed on to ECOWAS protocols or not. If you have to commit the lives of Ghanaian soldiers, because war is war, when you deploy in Niger, whichever way you look at it, we're going to sustain casualties. You must inform the people whose children the soldiers are, whose husbands the soldiers are, through their representatives, that look, you're going to commit them to fight in a foreign country. Some say, oh, ECOWAS is a supranational uh, uh, state. Is it? Is it a supranational state? Would ECOWAS be in the position to fund the war all by itself? To the extent that it wouldn't be necessary for Ghanaian taxpayers' money to be spent on such a reckless enterprise. Insofar as our taxes would be used to equip our military to partake in such a war, you cannot run away from parliament. Because remember that parliament is the only body which can authorize spending your budget. We sat on uh, our budget. There was no budget for the war effort in Niger. Nobody contemplated that. So if you have to go to Niger today, you must come back to parliament to ask for some supplementary funding arrangements for our armed forces. I am saying this against the background that I've heard some lawyers argue erroneously that because we've signed on to ECOWAS treaties, if you have to go to war, you don't need to come back to parliament. That, 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 that view cannot stand the test of time. So why did our Nigerian brothers go to Congress? If it was unnecessary for, uh, uh, you know, ECOWAS members to go back to their respective legislatures and, and, and seek approval. Why, why was it necessary for them to do so? And why is our government afraid to come to parliament? I'm sure they know when they come to parliament. What happened in Nigeria when the Congress disagreed with Tinubu will repeat itself. That is what they are running away from. That is exactly what they are running away from. The Nigerian Congress sat on a Saturday. So it doesn't matter that we are on recess. We can be recalled. Because in any case, what is so urgent about the Niger uh, uh, problem? What is so urgent about it? One, what, the coup was bloodless. From every indication, the coup enjoys popular support. You see people pouring onto the streets to support the janta. People are not being killed. Ma Niger is not experiencing a humanitarian disaster as we speak. So what is so urgent about the intervention 
so much so that they cannot come to parliament and allow the people's representatives to debate the issue and to either approve or disapprove of uh, the, 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 our government uh, 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 intended the deployment of Ghanaian soldiers to, to fight in, in, in Niger. In any case, why is it that when President Kabori of Burkina Faso was overthrown, the same ECOWAS mechanism was not invoked? Why did they not invoke the same mechanism when Alpha Conde was overthrown? So you see the selectivity I, I was referring to? They are being selective. So question is, how different is the Nigerian situation? Is it that some particular interest is at stake and that makes it an imperative for ECOWAS to treat Niger differently? That is a matter we must in interrogate. And you've had all these foreign powers threaten to intervene. But they don't have the backing of the UN to do so. So is it the case that they are the ones pushing us, pushing ECOWAS? Because I can't understand, Sena, why Niger alone must be treated differently. So right from day one, the ECOWAS intervention mechanism was otios. They knew that the, 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 uh, that, that particular I mean, protocol was hard, difficult to implement. That is why it has never been implemented. Yeah, because when rights are violated, you don't react. But when a government is overthrown because it is violating rights, you are quick to say, let us go to, the, 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 to defend and to reinstate the, 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 the collapsed regimes. So the issue we must interrogate now is who is pushing ECOWAS to act? Is it France? Or who is pushing ECOWAS? Who? So, now, so uh, to conclude on this one, I would insist that Ghana cannot commit its forces to fight in Niger if they don't come before parliament. You see, Ghana was one country which contributed troops to the Gambia to oust Yaya Jame when that country had challenges. Because Yaya Jame, you know, had clearly lost an election to Adam Abaru and, 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 and was refusing to hand over. When Ghana contributed forces at the time with that recourse to parliament. We cautioned the minister for defense. He subsequently came to parliament and delivered a statement on the deployment, the numbers we had committed, etc. And we said, look, this is what you should have done prior to the deployment. And the, 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 the house clearly was at Edom. On, 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 on that position that we had taken. So I'll be too surprised if after Gambia, they want to repeat the same mistake they committed in the past. If the minister goes on that tangent, we may be compelled to uh, file a censure motion against him because the people must be respected. And how do you respect, how do you engage the mood of the people? You can only do the true parliament because you can't go and conduct a referendum on a matter like this. So you come to parliament and ask for approval. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. This is the ranking member on the uh, Interior and Defense Committee of Parliament uh, joining us here in studio uh, for Alaji and Alaji today. I'll be moving to Mr. Philip Landing shortly. But before I do that, just a few messages that we're getting on Facebook on this issue. Uh, this one is from Francis Gordon, who says, Leaders of West African nations do not consult or seek experts' advice before taking decisions. See the U10 that the course has made on the Niger issue, Africa power. And then there's Newton, Bruni Newton, uh, who says, Akufuado got 
Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's suggesting that Kufuado Gabi and Bedie too should go and fight in Niger. <laughs> this, hmm. Sebi Shagu says, the ECOWAS and Western world are concerned about the ousted president not having clean water. Okay, they said, I'm not concerned about the ousted president. Okay, I'm concerned about the ousted president not having clean water, electricity, and not eating good food. The citizens have been living without clean water, electricity, and good food for a long time. Why didn't ECOWAS and the Western leaders come out and talk about that? Ousted leaders must also feel the heat. As I was saying, NDC Army, and that's what the handle is, kindly confirm for me. I heard the next ECOWAS meeting will be held in, here in Ghana. Yes. Uh, what wrong have we done to deserve this square leadership? Who at all is responsible for advising the president, for advising the president to take or not take uh, these types of decisions? It's so sad. Um, I think, okay, initially that was what we picked up, uh, but we are getting supreme information that says no that that has been called off. Um, so Uba will see. We'll see in the coming days. Uh, Yaira Achilo is saying what African leaders are doing is not in the interest of their people, especially the West Africa states. We know them to solve our economic, we need them to solve, we know them to solve our economic challenges, but not engage in an unnecessary war in Niger. Newton, Bruni, Newton again says they are protecting their leadership because, uh, okay, he's saying they are all thieves. Uh, Bawa Mensan says this jokers of ECOWAS are uh, just corrupt and greedy leaders. They are puppets of the West. That's what he says. There's Alassan Hamdan in Yohani who said, Where was ECOWAS when the Nigerians were suffering and dying every day? Why do they refuse to question the Nigerian president when he was not doing the right thing? So there are several other messages that you're sending to us. On this matter, if you're following us, this is the Mother of World Talk Show, Salaji and Alaji. Let me move on to Mr. Philip Landon. Good morning. Good morning, sir. My apologies for being a few minutes late. But uh, before I <coughs> give my views on this issue, let me congratulate again my good friend, Mr. Zipat, on his uh, celebrating his milestone. He continues to look younger every day. <laughs> uh, I hope you tell some of us the secrets. So that, uh, <laughs> you know. And also to commend his family for putting up such a beautiful celebration that brought a cross section of you know of society together. There was an atmosphere of. Uh, Celebration and happiness. You didn't feel any tension between any people, you know, political opponents, people, you know. It was, it was a wonderful celebration. And uh, so, okay, congratulations. And congratulations to your family as well. Uh, Sena, and also let me just make a small point. Uh, you see that I'm wearing black and red this morning. I've lost a friend. Consolata Akutampa. And uh, so from here I'm going to her funeral. And that's why I'm this. Yes, yeah, so on the issue of uh, ECOWAS, I would think that uh, the heads of state probably rushed in taking their initial decision. I believe if they had seriously thought through, they would probably have couched their communique a little differently. Because it was an immediate threat of uh, military confrontation. That's what it was. Nothing more, nothing less. Their diplomatic efforts was uh, secondary, you know. Now we see a reversal of the situation where they are emphasizing that uh, they are looking at the diplomatic options while the, all the other options still remain on the table. Now, the, uh, the, the difficulty I found with this situation is that I heard my brother, Honorable James, saying that uh, indicates that he doesn't support coups. We all don't support coups. But I see sometimes in the discourse, it begins to sound as though you are, you are either supporting the coup or justifying the coup. 
Because in all sincerity, we need to criticize or critique uh, ECOWAS for the way they have handled things. Not just with respect to Niger, but in the run up to this. And we've seen the way one of the strongest critics is Alassane Ouattara. Look at how he behaved. Just before elections, your preferred candidate just dies. Then you amend the constitution so you continue. I mean, how? And Echo has sat down, no comment, no statement, nothing. <coughs> we just thank God that there was no trouble with it. And could it work? It could have been a serious issue. I'm sure the people themselves have, were tired of all the problems they had had in the recent past, you know, their war and all the, the coup and all that. That's why they probably ignored it. But it doesn't mean that the people of Ivory Coast are happy. Far from the situation. They are not happy at all. You know? So things have been going wrong. ECOWAS has sat back. Look at Senegal. I mean, my kids are banned me for all the troubles, the, 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 the protests. He will not have backed down from wanting to amend the constitution. I'm going to do what what I did. Isn't that condemnable? Yet ECOWAS didn't say a word. Look at the trouble, the the the, the, the street protests, the routes, the burning and things. Dakar is a beautiful city. Why did they have to go through all that? Mm. Then the opposition leader is going through all kinds of trouble, being accused of all kinds of things, her house arrest. Can't they resolve this matter? Why can't somebody just respect the constitution and just live with it? I could to put, you know, and I was asking myself the other day that when President Kufo was president and he did his first reshuffle, his explanation was that the African peer review mechanism had reviewed his government and felt that his government was too big. African peer review, not himself. So he cut down the size of his ministers. His peers reviewed him as president and felt that he had a large government and other recommendations. So he quickly complied. Why is the African peer review in the face of all these developments and uh, the sub-region and the, the continent as a whole? If the African peer review was working, I don't think we would have had the problem we had because in Nigeria we are having serious problems. The president was beginning to behave in a way that the people were not happy with. But hey, nobody's talking. So the public resentment, public displeasure was building up. I'm hearing reports that the man who has now overthrown him was drawing his attention to the fact that, look, things are going on that are not the best. And he said that he's going to sack the man. Mm -hmm. The head of the presidential guard who had been head of presidential guard in the previous government. He had foiled attempted coups. He had been loyal to you. He's advising you. They say, good sack. Then this one too comes out. So you see, there have been various developments. And uh, ECOWAS is now, as a result of this, bringing up a discourse that is not the best. People are beginning to question ECOWAS itself, the heads of state. Question them about the way they're going about things. The Francophone countries that have changed governments through coup d'etats. What is some of the first things they did? Their relationship with France has been reviewed. And everybody agrees that these things that they are cancelling, all these agreements they are cancelling with France, well, why have they been there for so long? But everybody knew they were there, and everybody sat down and watched it. You know? so. It is time for ECOWAS to do a deep introspection to win, or I won't say win back, that's not lost, but to, you know, strengthen the confidence of the people in that institution. Because as it is now, uh, it, is, it is losing some of that confidence. The leaders are failing us. I mean, how can we be here? And I was also hearing the other day that the Nigerian leaders, one of the senators in uh, Nigeria, who is a former army officer, 
Or saying that, oh, then the people, the Jangta people, he knows them very well. Because most of them came to military uh, 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 colleges mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Yeah. They, to, well, they have that relationship, that agreement. You know, and there's a very close bond between Nigeria, especially northern Nigeria, and Niger. My information is that there are 13 states that border Niger in Nigeria. 13. I think Ghana will probably have only about two regions or so mm -hmm. that border. But in Nigeria, 13 states border Niger. And the commerce between them. You know, African countries, I mean, like Ghana and Togo, Ghana, I mean, we, we, Ghana and Burkina, we, 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 we are the same people, we trade. Somebody's farm is across the border. So in the morning, he crosses the water to go and weed and come back. It is natural. <laughs> you know? So these are the realities of our situation. So when these things happen, our leaders must take their time and decide. How can soldiers trained in Ghana at the Ghana Military Academy, trained in the Nigerian Military Academy, officers, command their men to go and fight their brother, Nigerians. How? No. When they are, they are insurgents around, the insurgents will be laughing. <laughs> the insurgents will say, look at these people. <laughs> so what would have been our position? You see, I, 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 I condemn the coup. No two ways about it. I don't support any coup anywhere. We should never have coup. And the coup situation must always be reversed as quickly as possible, if it ever happens, anywhere. It has happened in Niger. Let us see how best we can reverse the situation as quickly and as best as possible. Yes, for now, there has been no bloodshed. It appears the coup enjoys a lot of popular support, popular local support. Let us come to terms with those realities, those facts. And let us engage them. Let's engage them. If the Jangta leaders have personal friends, who are Nigerian army officers, send them as envoys to go and talk to him. Send them as envoys to go and talk to him. You know, for you know, he may have some family relations. In West Africa, we are all married to each other. You might find people like that. Send people to go and talk to them. Try and find a resolution. I mean, that is the best thing. If the, 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 the militants, yeah, the extremists, if they had overthrown the government, that would have been a different matter. That would have been an extremely dangerous matter that nobody could comprehend. That, that, that one, they are, uh, will support war. You see? But this is, a, 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 you know, a domestic house, call it a small domestic matter that hasn't escalated. Let us not pour petrol into... <laughs> Uh, something that is just a hot surface. It's not a fire yet. Let us resolve it. You see? So I think this is what we should do. The consequences, look at the sanctions. Right now, we're all complaining onions. Ghanaians didn't realize how much onions we are eating. Now we are suddenly realizing that uh, the other day somebody was saying that, oh, our farm place, we can go. We knew our farm place was there. Why haven't we grown the onions? <laughs> huh? Uh, our farm place has always been there. Now, before we are saying that uh, we, we, we have grown onions in a farm place. So, you know, this matter is very serious. Let us not let it get any worse. We should bring diplomacy to the forefront of our engagement with the Jangta. Yes, people have complained, and rightfully so, that when an effort was made to engage the Jangta, they turned away the ECOWAS team. But the same ECOWAS team that was sent to go and talk to them, the, the country from which they sent them, the president had warned, issued a, a, a threat. You don't issue threat and send somebody to go and talk. You know. So, I think that uh, ECOWAS needs to rethink the, the whole situation and de-escalate it for the good of the people of the sub-region, very seriously. And 
let nobody make a mistake. There is no economy in West Africa that is having it easy. Nigeria, the president, the moment he came to power, he will do the subsidies on fuel, which has brought trouble. Yes, the economy will be better off in the, in the long run. But in the short term, it's not easy for them. So they're having their own challenges. Every other country is having its own challenges. And like we are saying already, if we say we're not going for appropriations to go to war, I mean, well, what's going to happen? We cannot afford it. Let us not joke about it. We can't afford it. And I've heard all the military uh, 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 experts talk about it. How mobilize? How it will be to mobilize uh, our troops and move the the the, the, the border. Of Niger, the, the, the battlefront is, is, is going to be thousands of kilometers. At what point are we going to fight? Where? Are we? No. We should seriously reconsider this matter. Yes, it is true. We should take a tough stance against the coup uh, 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 leaders and that kind of thing. But today, as we speak, they have moved from being a janta to being a, 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 a regime. A prime minister has been appointed. Ministers have been appointed. A government is in place. So they have become a regime now. It's not just a group of people who are overturned the president anymore. They have moved on. So I think ECOWAS, and I'm just hearing from you that the meeting in Accra has probably been issued. I pray that they are seriously, you know, there's serious engagement going on behind the scenes. You know, because after the first heads of state government at uh, the meeting, the next meeting that was held was well, the chiefs of staff of the <laughs> armies of, of the military of, of, of all the countries, which was, I mean, you know, they should de-escalate and engage them for the good of the sub -region. I'm hearing that even the trucks in Nigeria, the border with Niger is so choked with trucks, they are stopping vehicles from even getting to the border because of the I mean, hundreds of articulated trucks, hundreds, have been stopped because of it. And all Mali's trade, uh, uh, import and export trade, is by land. Much of it, I mean, 90% of it is by land. Okay, so they use the other seaports, and, but everything goes by land. So I think that ECOWAS must carefully reconsider this thing. And look at the main problem. The main problem is the, the difficulty that the Nigerians are going. And we must also be very careful. There's another danger, dangerous prospect. You see, when America attacked Libya, they thought they were just bombing Gaddafi away. They attacked Saddam Hussein. They thought they were bombing him away. Look at the problems the world suffered. Africa hasn't recovered from the river of Gaddafi. Look at the splinter forces that emerged from Libya. Look at the troubles those splinter troops, uh, forces have created in the entire region. You are going to do something in Niger when there's already uh, 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 militants there. Activity. You know, you are going to embolden them. They will wait for you. Mm -hmm. eh? That's why I always say that, look, uh, if today and this year the PPC are fighting, you will throw blows at each other. We have your problems are still sitting there. So we should address the problem rather. You know what I'm so we must focus on the real issues. We should be careful we are not allowed to be used in somebody's proxy war. The French and the Americans are not ready to pull out. They are dug in and they are ready to lend support to any activity. They won't send their men. They will give us the equipment to go and kill ourselves. You know? Then there's a prospect of Wagner. They are in the region. Let us watch all these things carefully. Otherwise, in the end, the issue that started will have now become something else entirely that we can't contain. So I would wish very careful, very sincerely that 
our leaders will de-escalate the situation, give diplomacy a chance, and try and resolve the matter so that uh, the real problems of poverty and hunger and sanitation and education are tackled in Niger. That, those are the real issues, not, not this. So I think Thank that's you. what I'm Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Landon. Yeah. The final man here says that good morning. French government has this pushing for this equality intervention militarily. What bothered me is the m amount of money I heard from VO Africa News. French government is going to contribute to the military intervention. $25 million. Can you imagine how the member countries are going to share the $25 million? Uh, thank you. This is Lawyer David Ametepe, who is joining us, says, on the emerging issues of military takeovers, I hear condemnations of constitutional manipulation by incumbent African heads of state to entrench themselves in power and the seeming double standards of ECOWAS. Names have been mentioned, but I didn't hear that of Ekofuado. Why? Because he didn't change constitution. Remember the manipulation of electoral processes that is voter registration less than six months to elections in 2020 contrary to ECOWAS protocols amidst all protestations by opposition political parties. Is this he went ahead, he used the courts and vigilantes and security to suppress all dissenting groups. Remember how Ekofuado has systematically used the NIA, the EC, and independent state institutions to take over the country without accountability? This is worse than amending a constitution. I expect persons like Ekofuado to go to Niger and not to send soldiers. These leaders misbehaving in their own country with impunity must be bold to go to Niger and restore what they call democratic rule. That's lawyer David Ametepe sending that message. That's Musa Abatwa, who's a senator. Who arises when society feels insecure? Injustice, corruption, cronyism, nepotism, and mismanagement. African leaders must wake up. For instance, one government official can hide $2 million under her bedroom, whilst masses cannot raise two square meals a day. What's happening under Kufuadu and Baumien's government appears no different from what happened at uh, Niger. Uh, that is him joining us. Tafai Nama here, he's also joining us. Says, Sena, good morning. His friend government has pushed him. Okay, I think, okay, I think I've read Tafa in Nama here. Uh, there's also... Seidu is sending me a couple of messages. Uh, he says, I believe there's a rule or convention that when there's a bloodless coup d'etat, you don't force or military, you don't use force or military to reverse it. Unless there's a counter coup or rebellion in that same country. So why does ECOWAS want to use force when the coup was bloodless? By the way, what is the definition of democracy? What people want or, in this case, the people of Niger resoundingly support the coup. Is that not democrat democratic because the people want it? Algeria has pledged to provide electricity to Niger for a token of free in some situations. In fact, uh, if you read the ECOWAS communique, they are unhappy about what they say. Uh, some countries trying to undermine their uh, move. In fact, they say one member states who by their action directly or indirectly hindered the peaceful resolution of the crisis in Niger about the consequences for their action before the community. And then they also want to call on the African Union to endorse all decisions taken by ECOWAS on the situation in Niger. Uh, let's listen to Mr. Pratt. Well, it is now obvious that many of the West African leaders are beginning to look like clowns. It is also obvious that a number of them are so lawless it's unbelievable. They are, they are just implacably lawless, absolutely lawless. Look, the whole West African scenario with regards to what is happening in Niger is beginning to look like a circus. And I'm sitting back and I'm looking at the situation and I feel ashamed. I feel really ashamed, you know, of the kind of leaders we have and the kind of circus they're running. These West African leaders, many of them, are demonstrating clearly before the world that they are not in touch with the aspirations of their people. And it's clear. Senna, this week, ECOWAS held a meeting in Abuja. Hmm? 
to decide on what to do with the coup d'etat in Niger. One of the people who went to that meeting is Makisa from Senegal. When he boarded the plane and flew into Abuja, what did he leave behind in his home, home country? He left opposition leaders locked up in jail. He left a righteous society where police were firing light bullets, rubber bullets, and tear gas against his own people who were protesting against his misrule. What authority does, does Makisal have to be discussing the matters in, in Niger? What double standards? It's incredible. Makisal. Makisal going to Niger to restore democracy. Has he been able to, to restore democracy to Senegal where he's coming from? And it's incredible. And we're all sitting down looking at this clown. You know, taking everybody for a ride. And pretending to be what he's not. Makisal, Democrat. Can you believe it? He's also in Abuja planning to attack Niger to restore democracy. Does he understand democracy? Incredible. The other one who went there was making more noise than everybody else. It's Alasa Watara. Alasa Watara, a Democrat. <laughs> and Alasa Watara is a Democrat. He's, 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 he's finished building democracy in La Côte d'Ivoire. And he's now moving on to Niger to restore democracy. Alasa Watara. Unbelievable. This is a guy uh, who was installed by the French army. The French army overthrew Laurent Babo and put him there as head of state. He is going to fight the Lola coup d'etat. Incredible. Alassane Ouattara, who amended his country's constitution, we gave him only two terms, and continues to stay in office, knows about democracy, and is going to restore democracy. Unbelievable. We can, we can analyze all of them. Why? Tinubu. His election results have not been confirmed yet. He's still in dispute. He also is presiding over a meeting of ECOWAS to go and restore democracy in Niger. What happened to these leaders? What? Are you in Cuckoo's land? Unbelievable. And then the rest of them. All the rest of them. Sarah Leone. Look at the crisis in Sarah Leone today. Only last week they arrested virtually half of the military, military officers in Sierra Leone and locked them up because of fear. You see, Sana, I wish I could take a peep into, into the, the, the meeting room. These are leaders who are scared, scared of their own shadows. Leaders who know that their misrule is catching up with them. They are so frightened. And out of their fright, their capacity to, 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 to think has escaped them. So they are just there running around the corner like, like, like some bull in some China shop. You know, trying to frighten everybody else so that they are not, they are not removed from office. They can't frighten nobody. They can't frighten nobody. And they are so lawless, it's unbelievable. Under international law, and fortunately for us, there's, there's a, a very highly respected lawyer amongst us this morning. No country or group of countries can legitimately declare war on another without approval by the UN Security Council. These ECOWAS leaders, have they got a UN Security Council approval for what they are doing? They want to respect, they want to restore democracy, but they don't respect the law. They have no respect for the law at all. They want to wage war without a UN Security Council approval. And they say they are democratic. Where is their democracy? Unbelievable. How many of them have consulted their people? In Ghana, for example, the president is required to seek parliamentary approval before he marches his troops into any war. 
Has the president of Ghana sought parliamentary approval for this reckless adventure? No. Tinubu will tell the meeting. He went to the Nigerian parliament to seek approval. They said, no, we ain't going nowhere. So why is he presenting over a meeting to go and wage war when his own parliament has told him that he cannot wage war? Are these people fit to restore democracy anywhere? Unbelievable. In any case, what is democracy? So now what, what is this democracy? What is it? Check all the African countries, West African countries. How many of them have truly organized elections, uh, the results of which reflect the genuine aspirations of their people? Or the genuine choice of their people? This every four year election so is a joke. We all know it. What happens? The man with the biggest bag of money wins. The man who is able to manipulate the police and the armed forces on his side wins the election. These elections in West Africa do not reflect the genuine aspiration and choices of our people. And we know that. Should I cite examples? You saw all those videos about the Nigerian elections. You saw the truckloads of money. That's, is that democracy? Is that the democracy they are in a hurry to go and restore? Unbelievable! West Africa heads of states, my goodness, you are embarrassing us. And you do not speak for us, at least they do not speak for me. They speak for themselves. And you see, if they were to speak for themselves, even in their sober moods and so on, maybe. But these people are frightened. Frightened of their misadministration and so on. They, they are frightened. They are kicking everything in their way. This recklessness must not be encouraged, must not be accepted, and must be resisted with the full force of all West Africans. Something happened at the Abuja summit, which is interesting. West Africa is made up of 16 states. Only eight were there. Eight out of 16. What is the legitimacy of that meeting? What mandate did that meeting have? Eight heads of states were there, including one whose parliament has told him that he should avoid that recklessness and that they are not going to war. So what is the legitimacy of that whole exercise? Of the eight which were represented, one state was represented at ambassadorial level. That country did not even send its foreign minister. The president did not go. Defense minister did not go. They said ambassador in Abuja were represented. That's how serious they took that meeting. What kind of meeting is that? I, I, I can't believe what is happening. Look. I hear people say that, oh, as for me, I will not support any coup and so on. And unfortunately, my very good friend and brother, Philip, said the same thing this morning. Who are you to support a coup in Niger or not to support a coup in Niger? Let the people of Niger make their own choices. Why? We in Ghana, we we'll make our own choices. We are about to go for an election in 2024. Nobody in any West African country has a right to tell us who to vote for and who not to vote for. Or what system of government we should have and what system of government we should not have. So we should not become so arrogant as to think that we can decide how, what choices other people make. In any case, look at the circumstances in which choices are being made in these countries. Before the coup d'etat in Burkina Faso, 60%, 60% of the land territory of Burkina Faso was under the control of Islamic insurgents. 60%. It was not possible at that time to organize democratic elections. You cannot organize democratic elections when 60% of your land territory is under the control of insurgents. And these West African leaders, they sat in Accra and other places and said, no, no, we must organize elections. Organize elections where? 
in Burkina, 60% of land territory is under, under the insurgents. How do you organize elections there? They are totally out of tune. They don't know what they are talking about. In any case, uh -huh, how many of these West African leaders, so-called democratically elected leaders, can garner 10% of the support we see for these so-called coup leaders? How many of them? I saw the ECOWAS delegation which made the mistake of going to Mali to go and persuade the people to hand over power. Did you see the thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who met them in the streets and told them to go back home and that they didn't want to see them there? And they didn't learn any lessons. They were not ashamed. They continue. If I were one of those things, I'd be so embarrassed. Yesterday, I saw the videos of Nigerians massing up in support of their government and against French domination. The other who doesn't see those videos, how many of them, if they are overthrown today, would get that kind of support in their favor? How many of them? None of them. None of them. And they are only deceiving themselves. You understand? In any case, my brother, what are the issues? The issues are many. But I like to take the, the, the important ones. Take all French speaking African countries, take them together. All of them without exception. Keep their foreign reserves in the Central Bank of France. As a result, these French speaking African countries borrow their own money and they pay interest on their own money. To France. To France. You understand? So these poor African countries, but Niger is said to be the second poorest country in the world. How they came to that conclusion, I don't know. But that's, that's the description. All these African leaders are sitting down. They don't care about this massive level of exploitation of their own, you know, compatriots by France. But when a useless head of state is overthrown, they want to go and fight. Look, until recently, the presidential palace in La, in, in La Côte d'Ivoire, in Abidjan, was owned by France. Until recently. And West African leaders are comfortable with that. And in fact, let me tell you something else. They are not only comfortable with that, they want to emulate that. You know, Ghana was part of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. An association of, of countries which were colonized by the British. And we were all living with anger. Then after so many years of independence, why do you belong to the Commonwealth? Given its history and so on. And we should even get out of the Commonwealth. Then one of my friends became head of state in Ghana. He said, oh, the Commonwealth is not enough. Ghana applied to join the Francophonie. So today, Ghana is not only a member of the Commonwealth, we are also a member of the Association of Former Colonies of France. Can you believe this? Kwame Nkrumah's Ghana. We have embraced the Commonwealth and we are carrying Francophonie too on our heads. Unbelievable. These leaders, are they West African leaders? These are surrogates of France. Surrogates of the West. Look, if they tell them tomorrow that none of them should go to work, they should all go and sleep. They all go and sleep. These leaders we have. We are talking about a situation in which hmm, France has a large military base in Niger. The second largest drone base of the United States of America is also in Niger. West African leaders are not worried about that. Now, the drone base, what is it for? Is it for growing cassava? The drone base, the US drone base in Niger, is it for growing cassava? Hmm? Or is it for te teaching our children? Or for what? It's to wage war. It's an instrument of destabilization in our sub region. And the West African states have no qualms, they have no problems with that. 
Of course, how can they have problems with that when Ghana itself has through a defense agreement enabled the U.S. to use Ghana as a base for warfare? How can they criticize that? They are happy with that. You know, and the, the effrontery. France tells us that if we agree to go and kill ourselves, if we agree to send our soldiers there to go and die, you know, somebody's father, somebody's mother, somebody's uncle, send them to Niger to go and die, they will give us $25 million. Insulting! One African soldier is worth more than $25 million. Our people are not for sale. The era of the transatlantic slave trade is over. African lives should not be sacrificed or sold for money. And they have to understand that very clearly. That period of the transatlantic slave trade is over. It's not coming back again. And the earlier friends realize that, the better. That we should go and kill ourselves. And if we kill ourselves, they'll give us $25 million. What an insult. Incredible insult. You understand? Put that aside. My brother, after only one week of threats, go to the market and see the price of onions. The price of onions in the Ghanaian market have doubled. I don't know what is going to happen next week with the price of onions. And it will not just be onions, it will affect everything else. When I saw the amount of money we spent importing tomatoes from Burkina Faso, I was shocked. You understand? And you're going to wait war. You can't even produce tomatoes for your people. You're going to wait war. So if that is blocked, your onions are out, your tomatoes are out. Even those who eat kinky and fish, how are you going to grind pepper to eat the kinky and fish? Reckless decisions. Reckless decisions. You know what is happening? These sanctions are going to backfire on us the same way that the sanctions that the Western countries imposed on Russia is backfiring on them. And our leaders must wake up and begin to think. They must think about us, our interests, and so on. You understand? Now, see what has happened. ECOWAS today is at a risk of disintegration, total disintegration. Okay? You have Mali, you have Guinea, you have Burkina Faso, and another country saying that, look, as for us, if you launch this attack, we are withdrawing from ECOWAS. What will be left of ECOWAS? 16 member association, voluntary association of nations. Six of your members are threatening to withdraw, and more will withdraw. Equus would have been completely disintegrated. You know, and you know one of the funny things. The first time I saw somebody addressing a press conference on this matter, to my shock, it was one of my comrades. A comrade with whom I have been in the trenches for a very long time, I mean, very sober person. He was a rising academic and so on. I mean, Musa Abu Fatah, uh, Fatah. He was the one announcing this. He's never held a pistol in his hand before. He's calling for war. Musa, you calling for war. You should take a pistol and go and fight. If you give me a pistol, he'll probably shoot himself. He's also there in his nice suit calling for war. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What, what, what is this? How about seven pony? What is this? I, I was so sure he was in a very beautiful suit and speaking, you know, immaculate English and so on. As a matter of fact, war is not the Queen's English. It's not your ability to speak the Queen's English. You must hold a weapon. I mean, if I give you a pistol today, you shoot yourself. And look, let nobody take our soldiers for granted. Our soldiers are human beings like us. They have responsibilities like us and so on. Our soldiers, they are not suicidal. Our soldiers don't want to go and die in any foolish war. Ghanaian soldiers will not die in any foolish war. 
especially to say the useless president like the one who has been overthrown in, 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 in Niger. So those who are planning against the Ghanaian constitution, against Ghanaian law and international law, to send Ghanaian soldiers to go and die foolish death, they must think again. Because the soldiers will not die foolish death. And I can say that on authority. No Ghanaian soldier is willing to go there and die foolishly for some president he doesn't know. So they should be careful. Because this thing can backfire on us. And it's happened many times. Many, many, many times. We've seen that in history. And I can give you the historical examples of soldiers being moved into useless wars and coming back to lead rebellions against those who facilitated their death. Look, I'll mention one. You know that our independence struggle was spearheaded by ex-servicemen who fought in Burma and so on. Why did those ex-servicemen become leaders of the independence movement, Sergeant Tajete, Corporal Tipo, and so on? The war taught them important lessons about how useless the British administration was and how they were being exploited. So those who want to push our soldiers into war must learn the lessons of our history. It is a very dangerous move. Then, Sena, look at the state of the Ghanaian economy. Look at the state of the Ghanaian economy. Prices of food have shot up by 300% in less than two years. Electricity tariffs are being increased by heart. The price of petroleum products they don't go there at all. Now we say that we need to raise taxes to the extent that sanitary parts of women are even categorized as, as luxury goods. We are taxing sanitary parts, sanitary parts for women eh, in order to make money. And then you make all of this money, and then you put it in a war machine to go and restore the president of Niger. Me, I should pay more electricity tariffs. Mm -hmm. I should, any call I make, I should pay tax on it. If I make mobile money transfer, I pay tax on it. And I do all this just to go and finance some useless, absolutely useless war to restore president, what is his name, Pooh? Bazoom or somebody. Bazoom. What do you take the people of Ghana for? That they make all these sacrifices just for you to go and restore some president. And you say what? Democracy. Was well, that democracy in, in Niger? And then another important part. We are talking democracy and how to restore it and so on. What is the value of that democracy? That democracy is valueless, absolutely valueless, if it does not deliver on its end goals. Democracy must eh, extend people's access to social services. Democracy must improve the standard of living of our people. Democracy must lead to improvement in national infrastructure. That is how democracy becomes value. Democracy which becomes a sing song for the elite, which has no relevance to uplifting the living standards of our people, is useless democracy. It is not worth pursuing. And we must, we must make that point quite clear. The only democracy which is worth pursuing is democracy which is transformative. Democracy which changes the lives of our people. Democracy which makes it possible for people to eat at least one square meal a day. Not the kind of democracy which moves the price of KK from one city to five cities in two years. That's not the kind of democracy people would uphold. And then, <laughs> the other day I heard some very top government official in Ghana saying that, oh, as for Ghana soldiers, they would never stay their coup d'etat because they are professional and disciplined. All these military officers, what oath did they take? The oath which was administered to all these military officers. It was to uphold the territorial integrity of Ghana, to defend the constitution of Ghana and so on. So if we do not uphold the territorial integrity of Ghana, 
do not uphold the tenets of our constitution and so on, they will live by the oath which we administer to them. Then you write that oath. We wrote that oath and administered it to them to defend our territorial integrity, to protect our constitution. After administering that oath to our soldiers, we should do the things which enables them to protect us, to protect our constitution, and to defend our territorial integrity. It was my brother Philip, I think, who was talking about the northern border of Chad, of, of Niger, and what is happening there now. My brother, the reports are frightening. Traffic has come to a standstill. Goods and services no longer are no longer exchangeable. Articulated trucks are everywhere going there to take their onions and other products and so on. Meat and so on. Because of this recklessness of our leaders, commerce has broken down completely. And you see, our leaders sometimes I wonder whether they even know our history. Do you know that the boundaries we have today, hmm, as African states, not as West African states, as African states, were imposed upon us? In 1884, Otto von Bismarck, then Chancellor of Germany, invited his colleague European leaders to a meeting in Bonn to determine their fears of influence in Africa. They put a map of Africa in front of them. They took pencils and arbitrarily drew lines across those maps. And those maps became our boundaries. So as I've always said, I know the border with Togo very well. You understand? You go to Ghana's border with Togo, you find one house. The bedroom is in Ghana, the kitchen is in Togo. That is the reality of the African continent. So you will find that in Niger, most of the people living in the north of Niger share the same language and culture with the people in Nigeria. They are the, the, the even relatives. Their brothers, their sisters, their nephews, their uncles, and so on. That is what is happening on the border. And that is why Nigeria's governors on the border with Niger have said that even if even if the Nigerian Senate approves a war with Niger, they would not allow their territories to be used for that war. That's an important development. So how are they going to win that war? We will get Ghanaian soldiers, we fly Ghanaian soldiers into, into Niami to go and fight. In any case, how many <laughs> planes does our, our Air Force have? So how many flights a day are we going to make to send enough numbers of soldiers into, into Niger to go and fight? Crazy. They haven't even thought about this. And then I'll ask them what I say, I'll give you 1,000 soldiers. <laughs> I, I'll ask them what you do. Unless you give us 1,000 soldiers, you should go and wage war in Niger. 1,000 soldiers. <laughs> these leaders, master, something is wrong with these leaders. I bet my bottom dollar, these leaders, they have problems. These leaders have problems. The man we are going to fight to install is in the hands of those who are taking over. How are you going to extricate him from the hands? You are going to shoot your way. You will kill him yourself. You will kill him before the <laughs> West African leaders. I don't think that even kindergarten children will behave like this and think like this. The man who wants to go and install as head of state is in their hands. They are holding him. Go, go and install him. <laughs> hey. Hmm, Massa, look. We, the citizens of West Africa, have a responsibility, a big responsibility, to stop our leaders in their tracks. To tell our leaders that they don't speak for us. To make it plain to our leaders that we don't have a fight with Niger. 
And I'm talking about the youth movement. I'm talking about the student movement, the women's organizations, the trade unions, the political parties and movements, and so on. All of us have a, have a responsibility to demonstrate to our leaders that they speak for themselves and that they would not be allowed to abuse our mandate to wage a reckless war in Niger. I'm aware that there are many, many international organizations which are planning, maybe from tomorrow, to mobilize signatures to tell our leaders that they are on the wrong track. Let us all join those signature campaigns across the world. Let's mobilize millions of people, millions and millions of people across the world to send this message loud and clear to our leaders that we are not part of their recklessness. And that we have no intention of killing anybody from Niger. They haven't committed any crime. They haven't done anything against us. We will not kill them. If anything, we will think with them and act with them in order to build a more stable and prosperous West Africa. And West Africa, whose people control their resources and whose people exploit these resources for their own benefit and not the benefit of France or any other country anywhere in the world. We need to send this message out loud and clear. We have a responsibility to ourselves to wage that struggle until final victory. Alongside the struggle, we must listen to the voice of Kwame Nkrumah, who tells us that we should build an Africa without a bomb. And if we're going to build an Africa without a bomb, it's our responsibility to dismantle all foreign military bases on our continent. The masses of Africa, the masses of West Africa, we have a responsibility to ensure that no foreign in government no foreign country has a military base on our soil. We have to dismantle all these military bases and build a secure, prosperous, and workable West Africa which works in the interest of the people of West Africa. That is our charge, and we dare not fail. Because if we fail, the consequences will be grave for us. If we fail, we will continue to have the Alaska of Wataras as heads of state. If we fail, our central banks will be making losses of 60 billion and more every year. If we fail, our children will still continue to attend classes under trees. If we fail, our national infrastructures will collapse on our heads and so on. We dare not fail. We must win. And the first point of victory must be to stop this reckless and senseless war in Niger. We will win. Let's act together and we will win. We will be victorious. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's why the fire in cannot stop burning. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of messages uh, that we are tracking on Facebook, but we do have to take a break and come back and discuss the matter of uh, Cecilia Dapa, the Tef case and the saga that has come uh, as a result of it. So we'll be right back on the Mother World Talk Shows, Alaji and Alaji, live on Pan African TV, also live on radio, on Radio Gold. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. Hello, information. Barask. Me, I have still not got the money for that list of expensive building materials you sent to me. The price of the iron rods have been increased too much, are they? Madam, relax. Look, that's not why I even called. I just visited IPCP. What engineers told me everything about Chosako fast floor. Chosako, please, those people are expensive. Are they not the people building those big, big houses in town? I beg, don't scratch your guys. Madam, in fact, I used to think the same of until I visited their office today and they gave me an estimate of how much it will cost. No more, the estimate is free, oh. It's cheaper than the one I even sent you. Wow. Building contractors, foremen, mason, 
Ladies, visit IPCP, the Trasaco Fast Floor. Engineers will assist you build an affordable, faster and stronger building. Oh, madam, madam. <laughs> it is done. Oh. Trasaco Fast Floor. Stronger, faster and affordable. This is a Trasaco construction product. Hello, information. Madam. Me, I've still not got the money for that list of expensive building materials you sent to me. The price of the iron rods have been increased too much, are they? Madam, relax. Look, that's not why I did call you. I just visited IPCP. What engineers told me everything about Trasaco Fast Floor. Trasaco, please, those people are expensive. Are they not the people <laughs> building those big, big houses in town? I beg, go to the guys. Madam, in fact, I used to think the same of until I visited their office today and they gave me an estimate of how much it will cost. No more, the estimate is free. Oh. It's cheaper than the one I even sent you. Wow. Building contractors, foremen, masons, visit IPCP, the Trasaco Fast Floor. Engineers will assist you build an affordable, faster, and stronger building. Oh, madam, madam. <laughs> it is done. Trasaco Fast Floor. Stronger, faster, and affordable. This is a Trasaco construction product. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people. Thank you very much for choosing Al Haji and Al Haji, the mother of all talk shows live on Pan African television. Let's say a big thank you to the various radio stations that are currently tuned in to us. We're grateful to you for giving uh, this program this reach all this world. There are several of them that have been with us for years, uh, the Al Haji and Al Haji program, and we're always grateful to you. Shine FM in Akachi is one of them on 96.9. Uh, Hills FM in Adakulu on 91.7, Nuance Radio in Ketekrachi on 89.7, Sela Radio in Dabala on 97.1, Diamond FM in Tamale on 93.7, Bawa Radio in Yendik is on 106.5, Radio Kitawen in Saboba on 95.7, Benya FM in Elmina on 105.7, Global FM in Ho 105.1, we have Zebs FM in Zebila, which is on 95.9. True FM in Adesu on 92.5. Lamaya FM on 89.1. There's Boem 88.7 FM in Jastikan. Lukusi Radio is on 96.1 and is located in Vergolokwati. Tyne FM is on 90.9 FM. And we have Sekpele 104.3 FM in Likpe. Thank you all. I was going to go to a message uh, sent to me by, okay, this is Dr. David Percy. Who says, in, in Niger, we have one more example of France's African neo-colonial model in deep crisis and breakdown. The U.S. sees this and is working actively to insert itself and displace the French under the guise of fighting Islamic insurgency and terrorism, deliberately ignited with the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya. From my little page, I foresee this spreading through all our francophonie. Uh, and now some leaders of ECOWAS, including our own homegrown despot, are offering their services as the gendarme of neocolonialism to preserve French and American interests in Niger. Really, what have all, what, <laughs> says, how, what have these leaders been smoking? The people of West Africa must not allow this nonsense to persist. Uh, this is Dr. David Percy sending in a message. Uh, okay. Uh, there's also some more messages. This one says, it's from Martin Kwame, said them in Sovye. Please, if you profile the achievements of these ECOWAS leaders, it should not surprise you the decision they have taken against Niger. These are a bunch of rusty brains who have inflicted hardship and abject poverty on their citizens in their respective countries. They absolutely have no moral justification to take such military decisions on Niger. They should give us a break. Uh, that's Martin, thank you very much for that message. Genesis Akwete says, uh, good to hear that our so-called ECOWAS leaders are now talking diplomatic engagement on Niger, even though I doubt its possibility in the face of the reckless strong language so far expressed by them. I do not endorse coup d'etat, but it was inherently contradictory to hear a bunch of corrupt, incompetent, and vigilant leaders who have become Africa's problems and source of needless poverty and inequality to call for military intervention in Niger instead 
of them to wake up from their slumber graves and come to terms with the social, political, and economic realities that have become the breeding ground for such coups. Their corruption, nepotism, cronyism, narcissism, duplicity, and hypocrisy on the part of our ECOWAS leaders are the real problems, and the earlier leaders confront these head on, the better before we are consumed someday. Uh, Shalom, he always concludes. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, Stike is asking about whether we, have, we don't have an affiliate station in Kumasi. Um, Pan African TV broadcasts very clearly in the Ashanti region. So you can watch us on Pan African television. The truth is that Pan African television is all over Ghana, it's in several African countries. Um, this one is from Tafai Namah. He says, And I tell Kwesi not to be angry. Why did he? Why did he hear them say they are going to reinstate one of their own club? One of their own. It's a club. And only one of their club members have been removed. So they are going to reinstate him. In fact, I think I heard that uh, from the Nigerian president. Uh, this one is coming from Raymond Acha, who says, Happy birthday to my big brother and my senior, the man growing younger as he grows older, to the most consistent journalist in Ghana. His color has been the same since I have known him. Because he made a good Lord continue to bestow more vision, knowledge, and good health on you and your wonderful wife. I miss you. That's Raymond Acha uh, sending that message. Uh, let me do a few, just a few more on our WhatsApp platform, and then we'll go move on to our next topic. Asanko in Santa Maria says, whose interests are members of ECOA serving to protect themselves or to, to improve on the welfare of their citizens? Have they thought of finding out why coup d'etats are rampant in a zone instead of thinking of an attack? Do they know the repercussions of what they are trying to do? Are these, okay, that's what I'm saying. in Santa Maria. Then continues, are these MPP members qualified to be condemning code eaters? Don't they think what they did at Iowa so West were gone and during the 2020 elections are not different from code eater? That's a Sanko in Santa Maria who sent that message. Um, there's, this one says, I've been seeing that the onion sellers are passing through Togo to Yendi to down south because of the war. And same time, they are, they are they have been killing them for almost seven months um interesting that's coming from that's sent to our whatsapp platform uh, this one also says uncle Kwesi, this is my signature against ECOWAS military intervention in Niger. but if our leaders insist on going our soldiers should go and learn lessons and come and save us uh, he says a happy belated birthday to mr pratt isaac as i see send that from as a Kasasia, you see, Senator from Kukran to me. Thank you for the message. Uh, KK Francis says this group of old men parading themselves as leaders in Africa are selfish and do not care about their people. If, you, if we, we, the youth, give them, if, if you give we, the youth, no reason to leave, and someone gives us a reason to die, we will boldly follow that person. Africa must rise against this clueless, self seeking bunch of old men. KK Francis in Wa sent that one. Um, there's this one of Kama start organizing demonstrations in the various countries in solidarity with the people of Niger. Africa must unite or perish. Uh, he said that. Um, there's, uh, this one says, thank you for your enlightenment discussions on Alaji and Alaji program. In my opinion, concerning the ECOWAS decision to go and fight the Janta of Niger to restore the ousted president, convening that type of meeting is a waste of member countries' resources. Leaders should rather think of solving the economic problems the nationals are in which triggered the coup d'etat several more messages many more messages that you're sending to us via uh, whatsapp platform thank you very much keep those messages coming and we'll continue to thank you for watching the matter of all talk shows like you we have to move on to the cecilia dapa matter and uh, i'll start from my right as i did from the very beginning and start with uh, Honorable Agaga. Honorable. Cecilia, the past um, issue is very frightening. To think that a politically exposed person, such as Cecilia Dapa, had so much money sitting in her residence. The money 
was so colossal to the extent that her servants started stealing bit by bit over a period of time a hoping amount of a million dollars, not CDs, is alleged to have been stolen. In addition to 300,000 euros. I mean, this information is contained in a charge sheet. And in that particular criminal suit, Cecilia Dapa is the complainant against her own maid servants. A politically exposed person. It lends credence to the suspicion of the possible commission of a crime on the part of the complainant in that particular criminal suit and the complainant in that suit is Cecilia Dapa. What warranted the lodgement of that particular complaint still baffles my mind. Because, mm -hmm. say, if I were in Cecilia Dapa's shoes, I think I would have allowed this matter to fizzle out, knowing very well the consequences of lodging a complaint of that nature. Because she ought to have known that the public would be curious to know how she came by such colossal sums of money and decided to keep those monies in her home. I've heard people say there is no law which prohibits people from keeping monies in their homes. If you come through the uh, uh, laws, you wouldn't find a specific legislation which criminalizes uh, the uh, keeping or storage of money, huge sums of money in one's home. But that logic would only apply to persons who are not politically exposed. Once you are politically exposed, you see, the state determines how much you earn and so when if you are found to be in possession of huge sums of money which far 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 exceeds what you earn then immediately all relevant legislation such as the anti-money laundering act 2020 even the office of special prosecutor act creates an offense and, and those offenses created are such that the person suspected to have committed the crime, the politically exposed person, must discharge the onus of proof. So in this particular scenario, the, 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 the prosecution, that is if you are charged, does not bear the onus of proof. You who is in possession of the colossal sums of money, would have to prove that what is in your possession I mean are no proceeds of crime if you are unable to do so you have questions to answer you can be charged and prosecuted now the office of uh, special prosecutor upon hearing that Cecilia Dapa had lodged a complaint with the police in fact they arrested the suspects in that case and charged them, then decided to go into the matter and to investigate Isila Dapa herself. The revelations are equally frightening, Senna. I mean, the investigations are still ongoing, and so we don't want to prejudice anything. But you see, the, if you look at the Office of Special Prosecutors Act, it requires that when investigations are ongoing from time to time the office updates the public about whatever investigations 
they are, you know, seized with. So the Office of Special Prosecutor put out some pointers after, you know, writing to banks that Cecilia Dapa was suspected to have accounts with. And, and, and the revelations are equally, I mean, startling. Five million dollars, I'm told. Is it 500,000? 500,000 was found in her home yeah. upon further search. But we're talking about money sitting in her personal bank accounts with um, a Prudential Bank and SGSSB Bank. Huge sums of money. So you'd want to establish what line of business is Madame Cecilia Dapa engaged in as a Minister of State? And you see, to do that, one would have to even establish that whilst in active office as a Minister of State, she came through Parliament's uh, 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 Committee on Holders of Office of Profit, cleared to continue to hold such an office of profit. During the, her tenure as a minister of state, if, 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 if that was not done, then it means that there are serious questions to answer. My worry is not about Cecilia Dapa for now, because I know she's been investigated. It is my expectation that at the end of the day, if the special prosecutor finds that there is a case to prosecute, he would prefer charges against her. should have a day in court. But, Senator, my real worry is to do with the, 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 the security of tenure of the special prosecutor himself. Whether the system within which he operates right now would allow him to freely execute his mandate as provided for in the Office of Special Prosecutor Act, uh, which was passed in 2017. Why am I saying so, Senna? In this country, we have a president who doesn't believe in the fight against corruption. Time without number. He's constituted himself into a clearing agent so that when there are allegations of corruption, he is quick to clear his appointees. And when it becomes obvious that institutions of state seized with the mandate to fight corruption are responsive enough to take on certain sensitive matters, those who had those institutions are shown the exit. We saw that happen with Domelovo, the former Auditor General. When he attempted to audit government expenditures relative to COVID, he was stopped in his tracks. He was unconstitutionally booted out of office. Now, the intervention of the Supreme Court itself has been crit criticized because when civil society organizations, Professor H. Prempe and Co. decided to go to court, we saw how the attendant delays. Eventually, the Supreme Court delivered itself, but by the time the Supreme Court determined the constitutionality or otherwise of Domelovo's removal, his retirement age had elapsed. So, so the matter became moot. And so, my worry is whether this government would allow the special prosecutor the freedom, the independence, the, the, the act that sets up that office purports to confer on them, whether that would be respected by this government. Because their track record is very clear for all to see. I have serious doubts. But that is, that is a test for this government. Because the previous um, special prosecutor 
when he did similar investigations into the is it a Japan royalties transaction and uncovered so many issues bordering on corruption I mean you saw what happened eventually he had to resign he had to resign so Cecilia the past case is, is a real test for for all of us and, 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 and another opportunity for President Akufado to demonstrate that when it comes to the fight against corruption he means business so far he hasn't done that now Seda in as much as I don't want to appear to prejudice um, the ongoing investigations I, I, I would like to draw some linkages between the endemic corruption that has engulfed this particular government you know with the Cecilia Dapa case and other related matters look at the state of affairs with respect to Bank of Ghana the reckless printing of money their own annual report I think is one of the topics we've been discussing I just want to find out is there some nexus between the collapse of state institutions the collapse of our economy and the corrupt activities of government appointees is there some relationship but how about the integrity of our banking sector because you see Senna the way a manner Madame Zizilandapa was able to walk confidently to the bank and lodge colossal sums of money five million dollars 48 million Ghana cities and yet the bank itself did not immediately trigger an investigation in accordance with the anti-money laundering act which requires it to do so raises many questions so what is the integrity of our banking institutions under the anti-money laundering act the banking institutions together with some others are classified as accountable institutions what that means is that if you walk to the bank and deposit sums of monies that would raise suspicion especially when you are a politically exposed person the bank in question is expected to immediately report confidentially to the financial intelligence um, center for immediate action to commence did that happen what i'm hearing is that the monies were banked within a period of one year per what the office of special prosecutor has put out there so why did the banks involved not trigger some investigation by reporting confidentially to the financial intelligence uh, uh, center so that but for the complaints is led apart herself lodged with the police those monies that are being kept in the banks wouldn't have come to public knowledge nobody would have been investigating her if she herself had not gone to lodge a complaint with the police so while Cecilia Dapa is being investigated I think that the entire financial system in our country the banking sector hmm, the FIC these are state agencies established to deal with issues of money laundering I think we need to do a review of their activities you see sometime it was in 2014 2015 there about that Ghana worked its way 
in accordance with the Financial uh, Action Task Force uh, uh, rules, Ghana was able to work its way out of the blacklist of the Financial Action Task Force. I was part of a meeting that attended uh, a delegation, including Adabo Setepe. We traveled to Abidjan, and you know, at that meeting, when Ghana presented its report, eventually we were cleared and taken off the blacklist of the Financial uh, Action Task Force. Now, a lot of work had gone in to get us out of the blacklist. But you see, given what is happening now, I wouldn't be surprised if Ghana returns to the blacklist. I wouldn't be surprised. Ghana has now become a destination for money laundering. That is a fact. We can't run away. Because the systems are not working. And like I told you before, I'm wondering how come huge sums like that were lodged and the banking system itself did not trigger an immediate uh, 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 response. I'm wondering. Because as I sit here, how much I earn is a matter of public knowledge. How much a minister of state earns is a matter of public knowledge. 14,000 Ghana cities. That's my pay. A minister of state shouldn't earn more than 16,000. So tomorrow, if I walk to the bank and deposit an amount of $1 million, they should establish the source of the money. Right? Yes. They should. If I am engaged in some lawful business activity, it should be established. The bank must do due diligence. If they don't conduct due diligence, they themselves can be held liable in a way. Their licenses could be revoked. Whoever is head of the bank could be taken on. So corruption is an issue. So far we have failed. I don't know how we're going to redeem ourselves. I, I, I hope this matter uh, is investigated and uh, followed to its logical conclusion. If it turns out that she is not uh, uh, culpable, all her rights must be respected. But we, 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 we need to get to the bottom of the matter, where she got uh, uh, those monies from. Initially, when we heard that, uh, uh, there was some suggestion that an amount of 300000 was money raised from funerals, the, the, the monies were funeral donations, and uh, an amount of 800,000 CDs belonged to a late brother of Adabu Sicilia Dapa. I think those uh, uh, defenses, for me, did not make sense at all. No. $800 million for a deceased person. $800,000 belonging to a deceased uh, 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 person. I, I just hope that those were uh, speculations. It didn't come from Cecilia Dapa. It did not. Because it doesn't really make sense. So I, 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 I will leave it here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you said it did not, but I, I, I realized from the Attorney General's advice that they were even hammering on that, that that was part of the original complaint she, she made, that the money came to her mother given to a brother by her mother then to her. So it looks like that story actually came from her and it's a story that they are insisting on. Um, this one is from Mr. Adam says, the so-called Democrats who after exhausting their two-term mandates manipulate the system to stay in power it is the remote cause of the resurgence of coup d'etat in Africa. Equus looked on as for Nyasingbe of Togo, Alassane Ouattara of Côte d'Ivoire, and Fakondi of Guinea illegally manipulated the constitutions in their countries to stay in power beyond their mandated terms. Equus is looking on for Makisal to manipulate the country's constitution to stay in power beyond its mandate. As long as these manipulations continue with the double standards of Equus, coups will continue to occur. That's Isa Adam saying that says, uh, on, the, on this issue that we are discussing now, he says, I wonder if the prosecution of Dapisila Dapai is sincere or just a ploy to appease Ghanaians momentarily. Uh, that's coming from Isa Adam. Uh, thank you very much for that message. Uh, this one says a good morning to us. Says my worry is that nobody is, seems concerned about the hundreds and thousands of people in countless villages, communities that are 
displaced, maimed, and killed in the Zitilabai region, the southwestern, not to talk about the same in the southeastern part as well. And these areas are predominantly of a particular tribe, the German speaking people. But ECOWAS seems quiet on these massacres and oppression under their democracy. It's just a pity to hear Tinibu and his cabal advancing the drums of war in poor Niger just to save one of their own. Uh, good morning to Kabiru Sumana, who sent that one. Thank you, Kabiru. Um, this one says, we are clearly watching how this issue will unfold to the end. Livingston here, Chin Tamaklu sent that. Um, and there is uh, more from, okay, this Alamsa, Alassan Hamdan, so President Akufuad was already cleared to see the other So what is special prosecutor worrying himself about? This is a test case for a special prosecutor to prove him wrong. The world will never be destroyed by those who do evil, but those who watch and do nothing about it. Mr. Landing. You know, Senator, there was one message you read. Mm. I've forgotten the name of the man. Okay. I'm looking for that guy. Every time he sends insulting messages about MPP people and people. What, 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 I mean. <laughs> I don't think if you just read any message that comes, any message that is insulting, just delete it. We are here to disagree and state our, our positions. And your program should not be used by anybody as a platform to make you so. So I condemn, I forgot his name, I'll, I'll check his name. I'm looking for him. Uh, is it the one questioning your right to condemn the coup, the right of MPP members. You don't remind me of what he said. You don't remind me of what he said. Uh, Zena, this is a apart case. I'm not comfortable discussing it because it's, a, it's under investigation, it's in court. Oh well, it's not in court yet, but it's under investigation and the, 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 the accused persons are before the courts for now. So I'll refrain from discussing the matter itself. My worry about this case is that, one, it's not, it doesn't sound good anywhere you look at it. It's not the best. And I know the lady well. I feel sorry for her, but hey, she's found herself in that situation. Uh, my friend, the noble James said, In reference to his excellency the president, he doesn't believe in fighting corruption. That is not correct. It's not correct at all. His excellency the president believes in fighting corruption. There may be one or two things he has done that may suggest to him that that is not what he wants to do, but he believes sincerely in fighting corruption. And of course, the case of Dom Lebo is often cited. But uh, maybe he didn't handle that case very well. But for me, he doesn't <laughs> suggest that he is not fighting for us. So I just wanted to make that point very clear. <laughs> a special prosecutor, yes, he's doing a good job. I wish him well. And I believe that, uh, well, there could be a concern about the, the security of his tenure. But I, I, I don't see any threat to it. I believe he will do his job. And I also believe that the former special prosecutor was not sacked. He was not dismissed. I think he vacated the office. And I believe that, and that was his own voluntary decision. I believe that his experience or the experience of his Kenya will also guide and inform not just the current special prosecutor but also the government itself so that uh, it is there's a, a clear view that he's being given a free hand to do his work as we speak there's no sign anywhere that there's any kind of interference of any sort in his work in fact after the initial expose, he has come out with other findings. He's gone and found more money. He's actually found money in the banks. So he's working. And so we wish him well. 
in doing his job. And at the end of the day, nobody will feel uh, persecuted, but the law would have taken its course and all parties will be satisfied with the verdicts that may come out. Because when it happens like this, the accused must feel that they've had their fair day in court. The prosecution too must feel that they have also prosecuted their case in all fairness. At the end of the day, when the court speaks, nobody should have a problem. So I think this is what is going on. And I don't have a problem. My issue also now is the consequences of this type of case. Our banking sector is wobbling. It's not a joke. It's not a secret. It's wobbling. Our banks are having difficulty. You know, they've had to lay off. They've had to go into all kinds of problems. And taking our recent political history, it hasn't helped, or I won't say political history, our, our banking history has not been too favorable for the banks. People's monies have been seized and confiscated without their knowledge simply because the money is in the bank. Uh, all kinds of things have happened. So it took quite some time to raise confidence back in the banking system. And when this case first came, the first question everybody said was that, oh, why did this woman keep all this money in the house? You didn't put it in the bank. Why did you put it in the bank? That was the point everybody was saying across the board. Now, the same person is not being accused. There's not so much money in the bank. You want the money in the bank to help the bank. There's a thin line between why the money should be in the bank, why the money shouldn't be in the bank, etc. So I believe that in pursuing this matter, we don't cause ourselves too much damage. This is not a good case. It's not a good case. But we know that around the world, even in the advanced countries, in spite of all their tough financial uh, regulations and everything, they still also manage to move monies and handle monies, you know. So it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. We are in a political season. All our members of parliament, they all carry money around <laughs> doing their campaigns. And when they are doing a campaign, nobody asks them that you pay 14,000. If we start asking them questions, they can't answer. But that is what is happening. That is what is happening. And it's the truth. Whether you're a parliamentary candidate or presidential candidate, it's happening. So these are the, the realities. And uh, at the end of the day, I just hope that you see, if, if, if people don't save, if people don't put the money in the banks, we're going to have serious problems. Serious. Right? They, are, they are saying that even mobile money, the amount of money for, uh, uh, carrying in, in mobile money is challenging some of the financial institutions. You know, so this whole side of the case is something that I think we should manage uh, gently, to manage gently. Yes, uh, there are laws against money laundering and that kind of thing. But we should also find ways of encouraging people, no matter if somebody is walking in and finds some money on the street. You should go and put it in the bank. You should find ways of encouraging people. You go and find somebody, so long as they didn't go and steal the money. They found it under somebody's bed. They found it <laughs> somewhere. You should go and put the money in the bank. Let us help our financial system. You know. So uh, these are the issues for me. And another serious problem I'm having now also is that as we attack each other, the political classes, we, we also then uh, we, we also, what do you call it? Uh, We, be, we attack the political class. Because this accusation to Sisi Arapa, then there's reference, oh, then the other appointees, the other ministers, and the other former appointees, former ministers, the other political class. 
then we are, we are, we are you know, attacking ourselves. So this is a case that has happened. It's not a good case. The lady is my friend. I respect her a lot. I'm sorry for her. She's in trouble. But it has happened. It's one to her. I hope it is resolved and justice is done. You know, but uh, the collateral damage arising from this is my concern. You know, that's my concern. The case itself, like I told you, I'm not too comfortable discussing it because it's a case under, you know, under uh, uh, investigation and it's in court, you see. So I'm reluctant to speak to it, but uh, I think that, you know, it's, uh, we, we, <laughs> it's not the best case. It's not the best case. I mean, you, nobody can defend this. And I won't defend it because I'm not <laughs> here to defend anybody. You know, I, you can't defend this. It's, it's, it's not a good case. That kind of money, you know, for such money to have been lost. I mean, the idea was quarreling with my mechanic. I have some coins in my, it's in my car, the the, 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 the I keep some coins inside. I took them to do some welding on the car. When they came with the coins, were not there. I, I, took, I, I had a case with them. You know, I had a case with those, my mechanics. They're my friends, but I had a problem with them. So I can't imagine that somebody has so much cash. And, you know, if you get me seen, you don't even know how much cash. So everybody is different. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's what I was in on this matter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Happy Big Farms and Good Morning. If, if, a, if a minister can deposit money, she has then through genuine means in a bank, your guest is as good as mine. Your government is giving others haircuts by hiding your money at home to avoid some same haircuts. It's only an anonado that you can steal in millions and when you are exposed, simply put in your resignation and the president comments you and ask you to go and enjoy your loot. May Allah save Madagana from the hands of uh, this nation records. It says, belated birthday to my mentor, Mr. Kwesi Pratt. May you live as long as you want and may you never want as long as you live. May the Almighty God continue to bless you in all your endeavors. I mean, that's coming from Hadi. Uh, this one says, Senna, I like Mr. London, but today he has disappointed me. How can he say people must not associate president with corruption? That is Tafa in Amrahia. Uh, there's Martin Kwame said there, Ms. Sovier, who says obvious is that the pie is not in this alone and that there are other accomplices. If we were to be in any serious country with the desire to fight corruption, the very day this news of Cecilia broke, the president will have ordered the security agencies to secure a search warrant from the courts to invade the houses of his appointees to undertake thorough search to reveal what they might equally be hoarding. But alas, it is the mother serpent of corruption. So it is what it is. Very pathetic coming from uh, Kwame Sedem in Sovye, we sending uh, this one. Uh, there's Masala Pabli, and I also is, says if the huge sums of money can be found in the homes of uh, Quote, Bola Minister, imagine the amount that will be found. Okay, he goes ahead to mention other people's name. Indeed, we've been hit by smooth criminals, and it is time one million Ghanaians showed them there's a door in the general elections. Thank you very much for that message. Uh, there's this one's high, Senna. Our so called democratically elected presidents, 10 tyrants, are always uncomfortable with coup because they hide behind the law to abuse and suppress citizens. Don't they use same military to intimidate and abuse citizens? Mm. Well, there's uh, Justice Kwanyo who says, Senator Equus agreeing to go to Niger with military action, it is not necessary. Ni Niger is not going to gain proper independence after the coup. Niger should be allowed to breathe some oxygen after suffocation for many years under draconian France policies for Francophone African countries. No more colonialism and slavery. Niger just move on without France. Uh, he sent that from Ayawa so West, who are gone. Uh, okay, uh, these are some of the messages we're getting. Uh, I'll read some more. But let me first, come here quickly, Brad. Party, the current administration, 
that the Office of Special Prosecutor was being instituted in order to ensure that the prosecution of criminal cases, especially in matters where high-profile political personalities are involved, is free from the perception of political witch hunt. That's what we were told. Now, when the matter came up and was being debated in Parliament and so on, I made the point that it was impossible to pass a law which would ensure that independence unless the Constitution was amended. As it is, what we have done simply is to appoint a special prosecutor uh, who still clearly is subservient to the Attorney General and who only acts uh, on the basis of the powers assigned to the Attorney General by the Constitution. So this whole idea of establishing an office of special prosecutor is a ruse. There's no substance to it. And that has been clearly demonstrated in this matter. As the Attorney General has decided to take over the case. Take the case from the special prosecutor. How many other cases will the Attorney General take over in future? And if you accept this development where the Attorney General takes over a case involving a high-profile political personality, it becomes a precedent. So in the future, if the Office of Special Prosecutor is having a matter against Ukudatu Ablakwa, for example, can the Attorney General just walk in and take over the case? What then is the relevance of the Office of Special Prosecutor and so on? For me, these are very important matters that we need to address. I saw it coming. I spoke about it. Nobody took me serious. And here we are. The Attorney General has decided to take over the matter. Now, it must be exceedingly worrying for all political actors. Now, let us assume that MPP loses the next elections. Hmm? Will the Attorney General, hmm? will the future Attorney General be free to intervene in cases being investigated by the Office of Special Prosecutor? What will be our reaction? So I think we need to set the precedent very clear. We need to set the parameters very clear. So the abuse of office hmm? by politicians hmm, in order to victimize their opponents and so on will be checked. It's a serious matter and we need to look at it. Now having said this, it seems to me that many, 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 many of the commentators on this in Cecilia Dapar case hmm, are, are, are interested in the drama, the sensationalism and so on. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I think that we should build a society mm -hmm. in which we have a set of rules that governs all citizens the same way. Whether you are MPP, whether you are NDC, whether you don't belong to a party and so on, you must have a set of rules and laws and practices that treats us equally. And if you don't get there, justice in the final analysis is what is going to suffer. I'm a practicing journalist. I've practiced journalism for more than 50 years. You understand? And I know what I'm talking about. For many years, we have frowned on trial by the media. For many years, all of us have frowned on trial by the media. I see a lot of that in the Cecilia Dapar case. So many people were pronouncing her guilty even before she had been taken to court, or even before charges had been filed against her. I think that is unfair to her, that poisons our system of justice and so on. And we should find ways of moving away from trial by the media. 
Are you newspapers now? Casually refer to the money as stolen money. Where is the evidence? What is the basis? It may be stolen money, but as we sit here, it is not stolen money. It has not been proven. There's no basis. It may very well be stolen money. But I would not dare to describe the money as stolen money. It's unfair to her. Huh? It poisons the system and so on. There's a dictum which simply says that everybody must benefit from the presumption of innocence until pronounced guilty by a competent court. It must apply to all of us. And so now you will bear me out. Not too long ago, the issue of government official one came up. You remember. And I fought so hard. Yes, I thought it was so unfair to former President John Dramani Mahama. There's no evidence, useless speculation and so on, was used to saw his image. Today, three, four, five years on, what has happened to government official one? Where is the evidence? And so on. We must be careful with all such cases, including the case of Madame Cecilia Dapa. I'm not saying that she hasn't done anything wrong. I'm not saying that she may not have stolen the money. But as we sit here in the studio today, she's an innocent person. Tomorrow, she may not be innocent. But let us give her the presumption of innocence as every other citizen is entitled to. There are many problems, or a few problems that I saw with the handling of the case. References to the president as my dear, for example, in her resignation letter, I thought was, was, was terrible. Official communication. I thought that the president's response was even worse. You understand? And a few other things. But all of these things do not add up to make her guilty. My friend and comrade and lawyer, has said, for example, that the fact that she keeps money, such this amount of money in her house, is troubling. And it is troubling. Nobody will say that it is not troubling. Okay? Because if all persons who had this amount of money kept it in their houses, how would the economy run? The economy mops up all these kinds of monies in order to make the banking system function and so on. So, Keeping this amount of money, even though it may not be criminal, is not a prudent way to go. Keeping this amount of money in your house is not a prudent thing to do. It may not be criminal, but especially for a minister of state, it raises all kinds of red flags as well. There are other issues. Today, anybody who is a minister or high political figure or something, runs the risk of being attacked by armed robbers. Because there's a certain presumption that all the big men have huge amounts of money which they are keeping under their beds. In fact, I've heard people say that, look, if you're an armed robber, don't waste your time attacking a bullion van. Because what is under the beds of politicians is more than what is in the bullion van. That's a danger for all, you know, practicing politicians and so on. So these issues can be raised legitimately. You understand? You can raise questions about her, her defense, I mean, her story, that her late brother, for example, left the money for her mother and so on. You can question all of that. But I think we have gone beyond that hmm, to call her a criminal without a shred of proof, without a shred of evidence. We are trying her in the media, and it is so unfair to her. Look, part of the case is in court, at least the case, the criminal case against those who are alleged to have stolen the money. In the past, many of my colleagues would have already gone to prison ahead of those people for contempt. There are some of the things that are being published. For example, these uh, house helps or whatever they are called are also being described as thieves in the media. How dare you describe them as thieves? They only become thieves 
when a competent court says that they are thieves. You understand? So, I would urge caution. You know. And I would also insist that investigating bodies should not be in a rush to put things in the media. I'm a beneficiary. If they put things in the media, I benefit. I run a newspaper. I'm part of the management of this television station. We benefit from that. But ultimately, it is not in the interest of suspects. Ultimately, it doesn't help our judicial system to grow and thrive. You understand? So, investigative bodies ought to be a little more careful about rushing to the media with information from which sometimes is not verified. In the course of week, I saw the news item that uh, her accounts had been frozen. The accounts of Madame Sisiga Dapa had been frozen. In a few hours, figures started popping up on radio, on television, everywhere. By the next morning, the Office of Special Prosecution was saying that the figures were wrong. Who put those figures in the, in, in the, in, in the media? And for what purpose? You understand? So, and Master, when we were discussing these matters, when these matters come up for discussion and so on, the first thing we should do is to put ourselves in the place of the people we are discussing. Because if we did that, perhaps we'll be a little more fair. You understand? Now, I say this because I've been a victim many times over. We are in this country, when somehow, strangely, some allegation emerged and nobody could tell the source that I go and collected $125,000 from somewhere which was not mentioned at all. This story ran for months. It ran for months. Then finally, with the help of Mr. Gabi Asario Chidaku, we got to know the source. And when the source was confronted, the source only said, I was joking. But the story had run for months. If it hadn't been for Gabi Asariyachi, who would never have known the source, and the matter would have stuck, and so on. But eventually we got to know the source. He says, I was joking. Joking! So, I like to be careful. I like to be fair to everybody. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. the special prosecutor seeking a confirmation of the freezing order he had made on the bank accounts. They confirmed the monies found in her house. That's what the special prosecutor put out in the court document, which is a public document. But on the matter of what is in the bank account, immediately it came up, like Mr. Price said, uh, this is what they published. Uh, they have not, special prosecutor, they tweeted this, has not disclosed or revealed any information or details in respect of the bank accounts of Cecilia Abnadapa which are under a frozen order issued by the special prosecutor. The OSP urges the public to disregard media accounts on the purported bank balances reported to have been disclosed by the OSP. So they say they have not disclosed anything when it comes to the whatever is contained in her bank account. Um, I have 54 minutes past 11 now, and we have six minutes more to go. So I can do two minutes each. I don't know whether that is enough on the matter of Bank of Ghana and what is happening. Uh, so, Honorable, you we'll start once again for us. You have two minutes. Two minutes, yes. Say that. Two minutes. <laughs> Bank of Ghana. Yeah. Bank of Ghana has acted criminally for a very, very long time. And time without number in Parliament, issues have been raised legitimately about the excessive printing of money contrary to what the Bank of Ghana Act prescribes. And why were they printing money in excess of what the Banking Act allows? How do we account for that? Serious issues have been raised. Now, if you look at the annual report which came out and caused a lot of furore. The, the findings are, seriously, I don't know how to describe the findings. They are mind-boggling. Look, look at some of the findings. 
I won't even. We've all seen it. Uh, it? Yes, I won't even talk about the uh, sixty point uh, two billion CD loss, which is more than what we have gone to the twice the amount we have actually gone to the IMF to borrow. So the wastage. Eh? Now, the chicken have come home to roost. We all know why we are where we are in terms of uh, uh, the IMF deal and all that. The wastage in the system, the co massive corruption is what has led, led us there. The mismanagement. Then you have, you know, other findings in the report. For instance, 131.6 million spent on motor vehicle maintenance and running 131.6 million Senna, i was expecting to uh, hear that 131.6 million if they had said was used to procure new vehicles for the bank and that would have been as, uh, at least acceptable or made that sense to me. Time. But here, was time. we are talking about this colossal amount of money on vehicle maintenance alone. Then again, Senna, 97.4 million Ghana CDs. And this represents 246% increase over the previous year. And this is spent on foreign and domestic travels by the employees of the bank. Senna, is it the case that all of them travel first class? When they travel out of the country, at a time when they are preaching austerity. Th three minutes is up, Senna. Senna, is my time up? It's past. <laughs> Your time is past. <laughs> So should I yield to you? Uncle yes. Tracy says he will yield to us. No, no, no. <laughs> it is good what he said. It was uh, good. It okay, so let me, let me deal with the last point and then you yes. can take over. Yes. Then, worst of all, there is an amount of 287.8 million of undisclosed expenses. Undisclosed. Then they are spending over 250 million to construct a new uh, 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 office at Rich. At a time when we are supposed to observe rules of what? Austerity. When Parliament attempted to build a chamber, we saw how the, 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 the people of this country, the people, protested and the chamber was dropped. Bank of Ghana. Uh, uh, with all the challenges, Addison must go. Thank you. Uh, Senna, <laughs> look, the report of our Bank of Ghana is not a very pleasant report. It's not. These figures are not figures anybody can happily justify. They are wrong. So, I'm not going to well, when this issue, this 131 million came about the vehicles, I heard an official of the bank come out to say that it included cost of running the vehicles, apart from the maintenance cost, yes. fuel and other things, tires and batteries. It's still a lot of money. It's still a lot of money. You know, the banks normally have a higher income level. They are paid better than everybody else. The Bank of Ghana is paid the best. An official in the Bank of Ghana, whose contemporary is another commercial bank, earns more than his contemporary. That is no justification for the kind of expenditures that they are making. The reason I'm saying this is that it looks like it has been a culture with the Bank of Ghana for a while. Maybe because of certain level of scrutiny, these things are coming out. But I was also seeing an article where Retiring officials of the bank, the bank spent two million CDs to buy watches for them. Gold watches. Gold watches. You know? <laughs> and this was, you know, under the previous tenure of the uh, uh, previous governor and the previous government. So it is something that has been going on with the Bank of Ghana. Yes, it might be nice to, because your political opponents are 
the ones in the frame now to point fingers. But this is not a political issue. But Addison is a technocrat. Is he not supposed to be a the technocrat? The man is a professional, <laughs> top-class banker. I know him well. Some of the things that have happened, I wish, I wish to hear his own side of the matter. And I believe when he speaks, that's if he does speak, we will get a better understanding of what is actually going on in the bank. So, what is wrong is wrong. What is unacceptable is unacceptable. These expenditure payments, these ex levels of expenditure, especially this last one. The undisclosed. How can a bank say undisclosed? Bank. You know, I have a very good friend. Me and him had a disagreement one day. He's a banker. I'm not. Somebody, at that time we had just changed the currency. So somebody, this is our year group, and I was the president. And somebody donated some money to a year group. 100 CDs, 11 one CD notes, bundle. Fresh, brand new. It was so beautiful. I said to him, you know, I took the money and I gave him a check. He was the manager of my bank. He knows how much money I had in the bank. And when I gave him the check, he said, no, he wants a currency. I said, no. It's the same thing. It's so nice. I want to keep this one and give you a check. Cash the check and replace it. He said, no, 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 no. This small disagreement became a big disagreement. Later on, he made me understand that in the bank, even the particular currency note is accounted for. Mm. As a manager, he has to account for every note. The good note, the bad note, mm. the different denominations, he has to account for every single one. So that is part of his thinking process. So if he insists on getting the cash, it does not, he knows that I have that mm. money in the bank and my check will not bounce or anything like that. But that is how the banks work. So for the banking sector to operate like this, I can't understand how they can have an accounting that will say this amount of money is what undisclosed. Mm. So on what basis was the money paid? No, this one has to be explained. This is not uh, politics or this is just something that everybody needs to understand. You know, so these are questions that need to be answered. And when they are answered, they are answered for the good of all of us. I want my party to win the next election. I am working hard and praying very hard for a very good man like Alan Chemati to become a leader and win the next election. I know the kind of discipline he stands for. I know the kind of work he does. And I know the kind of plans he has. So that is what I wish for. And this is not the kind of thing that anybody would want to accommodate. It is simply unacceptable. They have to explain this to us. You know, undisclosed expenditure. No. It is, it, is, it is our money. Yes, central banks all over the world are having problems. From the uh, 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 US uh, Treasury to the uh, 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 central bank in uh, 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 England to many banks across the world. Yes, some banks have had, and even some of the financial houses. They're having problems because the world has been through some chaos. We've had our own share. But that does not justify us uh, 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 going beyond what you go, you know? So uh, all I'll say is that uh, it's not a good thing, and they must come out to answer. And just before we end, let me congratulate uh, we see again, because I think what happened last uh, Wednesday was 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 very really good. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 should, we should have more of that. Yeah, we, we need to cele era. celebrate him. Yes, celebrate him. Celebrate him more. No, it's okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> there's nothing to add. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, thank you. A big thank you to everyone who sent us messages. Um, uh, on the program today. I have to extend a birthday message that was sent to me a bit earlier on uh, by one of our affiliates, uh, someone who works within one of our affiliate radio stations um, in the Volta region. This is from uh, Hilda Atadrai of Lukusi Radio. It says, please, today is my son's birthday. Kindly wish him for me. His name is Kevin Makafui Nuchua. Uh, Kelvin Makafui Nuchua. He is 19 today. From your mom, Hilda Atta Dry. Happy birthday to you, Kelvin. And also a belated happy birthday to Sami Okujato Ablakwa. 
honorable member of parliament yesterday. Yesterday, yes, I belated happy birthday to him. He celebrated his birthday yesterday. Uh, ha belated happy birthday to you. Uh, he's known as the. Uh, he, he says, "God bless the king. God bless Likes." <laughs> Those who leakers. And, and then leakers. Those who leak documents. <laughs> so, but let us make them is the son of man. The son of man. Yes. <laughs> well, I know you have been celebrated over and over again. I know you've had several people send you all kinds of gifts. I know how we constantly fight when I say happy birthday to you. Uh, but we also have to do something. Uh, on Alaji and Alaji, we want to just present a small cake for you to cut here. Uh, as a in, symbolically on behalf of everybody who watches and listens to Alaji and Alaji, for years you have been the most committed member of the show. Yeah. In fact, like I always say, he knows the show better than I do. Uh, so Very we just want to, we just want to recognize that. And where is the kick coming from? <laughs> the kick is coming from us. Those of us who, who work with the show on behalf of our listeners and our viewers. <laughs> and I guess uh, Mr. Philip Landon, Honorable, oh, please let's join uh, him to cut this <laughs> cake. <laughs> well, that was some point. <laughs> yeah. And you are part of it. <laughs> mm. Mm, <laughs> And so you, you got a golden knife to him. <laughs> <laughs> so from the Thai team at uh, Analogy and Analogy, and also on behalf of, I know Pan African TV is your baby. Yeah. Uh, so also on behalf of Pan African Television, every affiliate radio station has associated. We say happy birthday. It's belated anyway. But you are in your cutting, so. Oh. <laughs> 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 let me join. Let me join. So, happy birthday! Happy birthday! <laughs> happy, happy birthday! Uh, so, <laughs> that's how we end today's show live from the studios of Pan African Television. We're live on radio and Radio Gold and several other affiliate radio stations. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We are back same time next week with another edition of the show. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered to lead his people into the land of freedom. He is the Redeemer. He has labored, he has suffered. Hello, information. But ask. Me, I have still not got the money for that list of expensive building materials you sent to you. The price of the iron rods have been increased too much, had I? But now, relax. Look, that's not why I even called you. I just visited IPCP. What the engineers told me everything about Chosako first floor. Chosako, please, those people are expensive. Are they not the people building those big, big houses in town? Madam, in fact, I used to think the same of until I visited their office today and they gave me an estimate of how much it will cost. No more, the estimate is free. Oh. It's cheaper than the one I even sent you. Wow. Building contractors, foremen, masons, visit IPCP, the Trasaco Fast Floor. Engineers will assist you build an affordable, faster, and stronger building. Oh, madam, madam. <laughs> it is done. Wow. Oh, Trasaco Fast Floor. Stronger, faster, and affordable. This is a Trasaco construction product. Hello. What are you doing Tuesday to Friday, 7.30 to 9 o'clock p.m. every day? You should be watching the couch. I'll tell you why. On Tuesdays, we talk social issues, lifestyle, health, all those everyday issues that affect us in the big ways.
Late Wednesdays are for book reviews. Thursdays are for the hard talk, those social, economic, policy oriented, political questions that demand for the tough questions to be asked. And personality profiling Fridays, when we get to know the stories behind the winning personalities we love. Inspirational story from inspirational personalities. Hey, listen, you really cannot miss the couch with me, Amma, but still, the only TV show with a hat. China Now is a show dedicated to providing the world with an overview.